Hello everyone and welcome to the second day of the ISF Virtual Congress 2021. And today we'll start the day, the day right away with a very interesting and a very important panel discussion. Panel session number two, which is titled The International Sea Trade and COVID-19 Key Learnings for the Future. My name is Marshall Bruins and I will be a moderator for today. Like many other sectors, the global seed sector had an unprecedented year with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. But the seed sector did not come to a grinding halt. In fact, quite the opposite. Seed companies around the world remained very active in producing, breeding and trading quality seeds. And in an effort to get a detailed picture of the impact of COVID-19 the OECD, in cooperation with the Japan Ministry of Agriculture and with the assistance from the International Seed Federation and the Asia and Pacific Seed Association, APSA, they carried out an analysis of such impact on the seed supply, on the seed supply chain, specifically on the Asian continent. And this roundtable aims to provide a better understanding of the global seed production chain and to spark a discussion on what the current challenges are and what policy responses can be carried out to safeguard the seed supply chain. But before we dive into our panel discussion, we will start off today with a keynote presentation by none other than Mr. Shaba Gaspar, and he is program manager of the OECD seed schemes. Shaba, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marcel, and good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank to ISF to give us the opportunity to present our recent study uh, on the uh, effect of COVID-19 pandemic on the uh, seed sector, the global seed sector, and specifically on the Asian uh, seed supply chain. As Marcel mentioned, this study was initiated by the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries of Japan because they had some concerns uh, at the beginning of the COVID crisis that they will not have enough seed for the next sowing season. As you may know, uh, Japan is relying on seed import, especially on vegetable seed, and that was even more uh, serious uh, concern for them. Uh, because they did not have enough information what will happen in the next uh, few months or during the COVID crisis. So that was the reason why uh, Japan contacted the OECD uh, Secretariat to provide them some uh, help and information, collect information, how the seed market is standing and how resilient it is uh, during the COVID crisis. To be able to do this work, uh, we contacted the International Seed Federation and, of course, the Asia Pacific Seed Association because they had already some studies and information as well on the private sector. And uh, we wanted to contact especially the seed companies in the region to, to have first-hand information uh, what's going on in the seed market. Uh, the OECD itself um, undertook some surveys also um, uh, amongst government of the member countries of the OECD seed schemes and we wanted to uh, combine these two information which we received from the government side and from the private sector to uh, uh, elaborate this uh, study. Um, one more thing that uh, the APSA worked with the World Vegetable Center during uh, their work. So uh, they also uh, provided useful information to this study. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. So, uh, 
So the, and I already mentioned some of the background concern, but at the very beginning, that was the concern that if we have enough, uh, uh, that, that uh, the disruption, they did not have sufficient, first of all, they did not have sufficient information on the seed market, uh, what's going on, because the information is scattered uh, between uh, private sector and the government, so nobody really knew what's going on in the seed market, even though the seed sector is one of the best regulated sector in agriculture. Um, the other concern was how long the COVID-19 pandemic will last. And as we see, even today, uh, even though in some areas of the world, the uh, things are improving, the, the pandemic is, uh, we have a better situation, but many parts of the world are still suffering from COVID-19. So we are still not over of this uh, crisis. Um, the other concern was that, uh, many countries and most countries they uh, 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 declared the agricultural sector as essential so it allowed the production of agricultural products including seed in most of the countries but as we saw from the studies some asian countries uh, still suffered from restrictions and movement of people and also uh, transport of seed so that was also uh, a concern, how we can manage this uh, situation. And of course, all the, the governments, they uh, undertook different measures to stop the COVID-19 virus and the spreading of the virus with lockdowns, uh, social distancing measures, uh, reducing mobility, uh, and a lack of transportation because the air traffic uh, and land traffic was restricted. So all of those issues affected the seed trade. If I can go to the next slide, I would like to just uh, briefly mention the key outcome of our uh, survey uh, on the Asian market and also some global uh, consequences and relevance of that uh, study. Of course, the study is a quite a lengthy paper, so I would not like to go into all of the details, but I just want to send the key message that what we ex experienced during this study that the seed demand was uh, decreased in Asia, and that had various reasons uh, probably because the, the tourism was down, so restaurants, they did not order enough uh, vegetables, for example, so producers, they saw that and uh, they produced less, so demand was less for seed as well. And it was different uh, logistical problems, but also on the other hand, uh, some companies experienced increase of seed for, for, uh, for the consumers, so persons who stayed home started to grow vegetables more and more often. So that was, uh, uh, they had better market for the small packages of vegetable seed. But altogether in Asia, the conclusion was that the demand decreased and the companies they concerned about that. Uh, the other uh, concern was the, or problem was the availability of stuff for seed production chain. But also it was a problem that in the government sector, it was also uh, a problem. It was not enough stuff because the social distancing and uh, <clears throat> lockdowns. So it affected the, the production uh, in many uh, countries. Uh, the other outcome was the, of the study um, that the distribution uh, of the seed from the seed production side to the farmers was disrupted. And that was mostly thanks to the travel restrictions, uh, transport, uh, availability of transport, air, air transport or land transport, both of them, they were problems. Uh, and also uh, crossing borders was also an issue. Uh, all in all, uh, we concluded that uh, Asia and Pacific region was more affected by the COVID-19 than generally the other parts of the world because uh, seed companies who had the headquarter in the Asia Pacific region 
they suffered more than seed companies who had the headquarters outside of the region. Uh, but the good news is that uh, despite all of the challenges, the global seed supply chain uh, was reasonably resilient during the crisis. And that was underlined by uh, the International Seed Federation as well, according to their information received from the seed companies all over the world. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, of course, OECD uh, is uh, our, our main job is to uh, provide policy advices to our governments, and this study is not different. Um, so we, based on the outcome of the surveys, uh, we uh, uh, provided some policy advices to our member countries, but it will be also available to everyone once the study will be declassified and uh, disseminated. Uh, first of all, before going to the detailed policy recommendations, I would like to tell some considerations which the government had to take into account or should take into account when they uh, change policies. First of all, uh, seed, as you know very well, as this is a, a seed sector meeting, uh, play a key is a key input uh, to for the agricultural supply chain, and it play a clear key role in uh, food security to provide uh, sufficient and nutritious food for the population. So this makes the seed sector very important for all of the governments. Um, access to high quality seed is also very important because it helps to increase the livelihood of uh, farmers and the resilience of the sector in general, uh, including the farmers or other actors in the seed uh, or the food supply chain. Um, the other important fact uh, which has to be considered that most of the countries, they cannot supply uh, uh, farmer with uh, high quality seed of their choice from their own production. So international seed trade is necessary and international seed supply chain is has to be or should be maintained uh, to be able to, to give the right choice of seed to the farmers and the agricultural sector. Um, economically, of course, is is a lot of benefits of an internationally interconnected supply chain, and the seed supply chain is very similar to, to that. So if a country wants a resilient uh, seed sector, it has to, the national seed sector should be connected to the international seed supply chain. Uh, this is an issue because during the COVID crisis, some governments or policymakers started to uh, think about to nationalize uh, the seed production. Of course, it was understandable because everybody was afraid that they will not, there will be no seed available on the market. <clears throat> but what we see at OECD that uh, the risk of uh, nationalizing a system, economic risk, is higher than having an international interconnected uh, system and mitigate the negative effects of that international interconnected system, such as, for example, uh, uh, disruption in transportation or other <coughs> similar issues. Um, the other the last one that uh, governments, they missed up-to-date information um, during the crisis, even though I said that uh, the seed sector is a well-regulated uh, sector in agriculture, but because of the specificity of the sector, many of this information on stocks and ongoing production is held by the private sector and some parts held by the government. So it's very difficult to collect all of this information together as of today. So this is, <clears throat> I think the policy makers, they need to consider this uh, specificity of the sector when they uh, 
start to develop new policies to make the seed sector more resilient. So if we can go to my next slide, please. So we can go to the policy recommendations uh, and I would like to just mention the, the main uh, recommendations. The first recommendation would be to ensure production and movement of seed during the crisis. Of course, this is quite an obvious uh, recommendation, but as we experienced during the study in Asia, that was not uh, obvious. Some countries that the movement of seed was not uh, maintained as it should be. So uh, we recommend all of the countries to, to uh, classify the seed sector and agriculture sector as uh, essential, which would help to continue the production of uh, seed and the movement of seed uh, in the country and also uh, uh, the international trade of seed. Um, the other important issue which uh, has to be considered that uh, during a crisis, making uh, sudden changes to the regulatory framework of the seed trade can affect negatively the trade and the availability of seed because the government officials are under the pressure during a crisis. They have a lot of work, so it's dif uh, difficult to adopt new uh, requirements. But it can be said on the other side of the seed sector and seed companies, they need to follow uh, different regulations and if change during the crisis, it would be difficult to fulfill all of the changed requirements. So we suggest to avoid dramatic changes to the uh, regulatory framework. <clears throat> the, the last uh, part of this recommendation would be to increase communication and coordination between the national uh, authorities, because we saw in the crisis that there were sudden um, different uh, uh, actions from the government uh, to mitigate the effects of the pandemic, but it was not harmonized at the very at the beginning of the crisis, so it affected the trade and. Uh, we saw in our seed scheme when the, the government started to communicate, they found solutions which was uh, acceptable for all. So that facilitated uh, and met, uh, to, to help to maintain the seed production and trade and also the availability of seed for farmers. Uh, if we go to my next slides, please. So uh, as I said, the internationally interconnected uh, seed supply chain has a lot of economical benefits, which overweight the risks, uh, and it's better to mitigate this risk than nationalizing the seed production and uh, try to supply farmers with seed from uh, local production. Um, the internet, actually seed companies, especially the big international seed companies, they follow this uh, practice for a long time now, that they have pro seed production sites uh, around the world in different spots, which can help to mitigate uh, uh, climatic problems or any kind of issues with seed production. So if one side is down, uh, the seed can be produced in the other side so the seed, seed supply is more uh, stable and uh, safer and more resilient in this way. So we suggest uh, for the governments to, to help at uh, this international, uh, international and diverse uh, seed production. And there are uh, different ways to do that. The first of all, uh, as OECD is also part of the international regulatory framework for the international sea trade with other international organizations such as uh, ISTA, UPOV, uh, but also we can mention ISF on, from the private sector side. So it is recommended to support uh, active participation in these international organizations uh, because this is how we can harmonize uh, the policies and standards um, in the different countries 
which would help uh, to reduce technical barriers uh, to trade. The other important issue is to help developing countries to be able to uh, access to the international sea trade as a producing country. So that would help the developing country to uh, increase or develop their national seed sector. They can learn uh, new technologies and uh, they will have more money if they produce seed for other countries. But also they could sell their seed uh, for other countries on, as a next step. So that would be um, useful uh, from both sides uh, for the stability of the international seed supply chain but also for the national uh, food security uh, issues. Um, and also, I mean, as OECD is doing that, we can provide capacity building for these companies to help them to uh, adopt the international standards, such as the OECD seed certification standards. If we can go to my uh, next slide which would be to support digitalization of the seed supply chain. <clears throat> the COVID-19 uh, crisis highlighted the importance of the digitalization of, uh, of the different regulatory frameworks, such as OECD seed scheme, but IPPC, ISTA, and UCOV also have digital systems. We found it uh, that in the, our OECD survey, that those countries who digitalized their national certification system, they were more resilient, they had less problem to maintain seed production than those countries who did not do that. So we would suggest uh, to uh, start developing digital systems, especially international digital systems, which could help to uh, mitigate problems of uh, development between the development uh, uh, levels of, of different countries because some countries may have it money to digitalize their system. Some countries they don't, but if we have an international digital network or system, that would be easier and cheaper for the countries to join that international uh, digital network. Um, as I mentioned, in the OECD, we just started our digitalization uh, project and we have a high hope uh, for that, which could increase the, I mean, it would reduce the cost of the, the certification cost in one hand, but it would also have to increase the transparency of the seed market. And also it would be a good tool to combat fraud uh, when the system will be set up. Uh, my next slide, please. And as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, uh, it is important that the decision makers, they have uh, the right data because this is the way how they can do uh, uh, evidence-based decisions. So it's very important that the government officials and policy makers, they have that information on their hand when they create new uh, policies. At the moment, uh, this information is missing from the seed sector, um, particularly, as I mentioned before, the information scattered, held by private sector and government sector. So it's difficult to put together the information. Um, there are some examples in the agriculture sector for such uh, information system which is one is the AMIS, which was developed by the G20 uh, to forecast any food crisis. Um, and, and actually this is uh, an international database of available stocks of different uh, food products. Um, B, uh, as always, it is also a working and part of this AMIS the system. We had discussion in the house if similar system would work in the seed sector. But uh, we found that uh, because of the specificities of the seed sector, such information system would be not really <coughs> useful. So we cannot like joining AMIS, which would be the easiest uh, way of doing this. 
And most problem, which I think, is that the seeds cannot be replaced by another seed because it's a different variety, it's adapted for different conditions, or some varieties are not approved by some countries, thinking about the GMO uh, varieties. So that would be very difficult to replace. So even if we have a stock of uh, corn seeds somewhere, this does not mean that it would be available and useful for the country who want to buy that seed. Uh, so um, at the moment, we are missing this international uh, network or database. Um, but uh, as I mentioned, we are working on a, a digitalization of our seed scheme. And one part of that digital system would be an international seed certification hub, where we would like to collect information on the ongoing seed production, which could be a good indicator to policymakers how uh, the seed uh, availability uh, change uh, during the time. Uh, but this is the future, and we are working on that, and we will see if this system could be a basis of an international information system on uh, seed availability worldwide, or at least in OECD seed scheme member countries. Uh, Marcel, that was my presentation. And thank you very much for your attention. And I would keep the floor back to Marcel. Thank you so much, Shaba. That was very interesting and also very important. Uh, I think it is crucial that uh, we have such sets of recommendations for governments so that they can further work on improving the resilience of their seed sector. So what I, what I heard you say was two important recommendations. Um, one, that there should be more intergovernmental digitalization initiatives to bridge, to bridge that digital divide. And the second big recommendation that I heard you say is that there is a need for more international coordination on real-time data sharing, and that, of course, can lead to early warning systems. Is that a good capture? Thank you, Marcel. Yes. Uh, on the first one, on digitalization, as I mentioned, many of the international organizations are working on digital projects. But actually, at the end, it would be a, at the end that the main goal would be to develop one or an interconnected uh, digital system between these international organizations. As you know, you have the eFITO, the ISTA certificate, the digital OECD level, and it would be all interconnected. That would be the final solution. And actually, the international organizations have this goal. As you may know, Marcel, that we have the World Seed Partnership, and all of these organizations are members of that uh, uh, initiative. So we are harmonizing our digital initiatives as much as possible. So we will see this is the future, but I think this is what is a good direction, and we should not uh, miss this opportunity. On, on the early warning system, I think this would be also important, but we have a lot of challenges here because of the availability of information. But at the end, I think it would be useful if we would have a certain level of uh, information sharing, harmonization of information mm -hmm. sharing uh, systems. So that, that would be a great uh, development, but that's also the future. Thank you, Shaba. That is uh, very interesting. And of course, it's clear that the COVID-19 pandemic meant a lot of hardship for a lot of people. But it is also very important that we try and learn from it. For example, through the study that the OECD has recently carried out. Next up, we will hear from our first four panelists. We have four experts for you, either here in the studio or joining us remotely. And from Paris, we have joining us online Ms. Leanne Jackson, and she is the head of the Agrofood Trade and Markets Division at the OECD. Hello, Leanne. Hi, Marcel. Nice to see you. And from Bangkok, joining us, we have Ms. May Chochui, and she is the executive director at the Asia and Pacific Seed Association, APSA. Hello, May. 
Hi, Sawadika. Hi, Marcel, and everyone. From India, we have joining us Mr. Artur Santosh Atavar, and he is chairman and managing director of the company Indo American Hybrid Seeds. Welcome, Artur. Yeah, thanks, Marcel. Thanks. And here with me in the studio is Mr. Shabosh Rutner, and he is Regulatory Affairs Manager at the ISF. Good morning, Marcel. Um, we will now soon uh, open the live Q&A with all participating delegates to the Congress. So if you have any questions for our expert panelists, please make sure you're typing your questions into the Q&A function on your screen, and I will be receiving those questions here on my iPad as they come in. So let's start off straight away with our first question, and I'd like to start from a broad perspective, a global perspective. Shabi, um, what would you say has been the impact of the pandemic from that global perspective? Thank you very much, Marcel. Indeed, we heard a lot of um, um, good uh, coverage from, from Chaba's presentation. So if I would like to highlight a few, uh, first of all, we, we try to gather information from our members, from our National Seed Association. So we made a, a several survey throughout the pandemic and we give uh, very good feedback from, from all over the world. We haven't really go down to the uh, individual company's detail. We wanted to have indeed a more comprehensive overview mm -hmm. of what's happening in the seed trade globally. And uh, indeed in different regions were, were, were different. So there were regions, especially those regions where you have like a a legislative framework, a common legislative framework, they, they coped uh, a lot better and, and easier in, in, this, in this pandemic situation, while others uh, have, have, have more problem. I think if I have to pick a few uh, examples which were basically uh, present everywhere, is the, uh, the problem of the movement of labor, because as we know, seed industry is a very uh, labor intensive uh, um, a sector. The other one is to access to, to transport uh, and also the, 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 the price of, of the transport which has been increased and also, also some administration problems, especially at the, uh, at the uh, uh, seed certification, uh, variety registration, seed export import permits, uh, which, which slowed down. Um, and this was, I think, which was, which was, we felt everywhere. So no matter uh, which region we gave, uh, we got answer, uh, there was a, there was a, a common thing. Uh, on the other hand, what we also experienced, and it was also uh, Chaba alluded to, that uh, companies reacted uh, very fast uh, to these, to these challenges. So they implemented measure, measures in, um, in-house to protect uh, their, their workers, but still maintain a good level of, of operation. So I think this was very positive ex experience for us. From the, from the government side, uh, also uh, almost all governments, we got feedback, they declared agriculture, including seeds, and an essential business as a critical business. So some form of uh, flow of uh, seeds could be a, could be uh, provided even for in the most precious time. So I think the bottom line is that, that no farmer left without a seed. And this is, I think, war, what our sector is, 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 is biggest aim. So I think we absolutely fulfilled uh, our, our, our primer goal and primer objective to, to provide the farmers uh, with, uh, with sufficient good quality seed. Um, we experienced, of course, problems. But if you see an overall picture, um, and this again, it's an overall picture, so some region probably suffer most, what we see that uh, the impact on the business itself, in the end, it hasn't been negative. So uh, mm -hmm. companies are still uh, coping really well and, and, um, and didn't change too much in their, in their major operations. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Shabi. Um, now that we've heard uh, the global uh, perspective. I may, I would like to, to turn to you. Um, Shaba, in his presentation, he spoke about the impact of the pandemic on the seed sector in Asia. Could you share a bit uh, about the impact of the pandemic in your region? 
Yeah, thank you very much, Marcel, for this question. I just would like to elaborate more on the Shabbat presentation and also similar to what uh, Shavi has shared from the global impact, right? So APSA and World Vegetable Center, we work together since May 2020. Well, actually, we started from April 2020 to study this impact when the you know the government start to impose the lockdown policy and travel restriction in most countries in Asia Pacific region. So in that time, we could reach out to around 132 companies, and most of the companies who have responded they are from medium and small size companies. In that time, we when we collected the, the data, we found that. Well, 60% of, of responders reported that see demand and their capability to work on research and development, as well as the production trials had dropped. And that, of course, due to travel restriction and labor shortage. And so the highest negative impact was found in the international seed shipment due to the high freight cost. And I think that this is similar to what Shaba or ISF has found the same. And I believe that not only Asia Pacific, but of course other regions um, got the same effect or impact on that. And beside that, we observe a uh, slowly time of getting the custom clearance and acquiring import permits. And so beside that, um, APSA also has done more study on the seed trade volume that we will uh, publish in our magazine issue two. So we found that actually the volume of seed trade in 2020 in Asia Pacific region, we see slight uh, drop also in the volume of seed export. Uh, we found a drop around 10% comparing to the four year annual average. And the decline also was even foul as double or 20% less than the baseline that we compare the from the four years, the previous four years for import volume in Asia Pacific region. So basically, I do believe that um, that's create um, an impact also in you know in the volume that we can see also in the data. Thanks, Michelle. Michelle. Thank you, May. Uh, I heard you say 60% of the companies, of the responding companies, um, reporting an, a, a negative effect. That's quite high. Uh, but of course, that was 2020. Uh, and I, I know that you also did a recent, more recent uh, assessment of the impact of COVID in, in 2021. Can you share a little bit about what happened there? Definitely, Marcel. Um, so recently, we worked with our working group of integrated vegetable seed companies and our standing uh, well, special interest group of few crops companies. So in total, there are around 34 companies. which actually they have, uh, you know, like a high Im impact, I would say, or very good reputation in terms of vegetable seeds production and few crops production in the region. So we found the report, um, of course, in terms of the perspective that the company thinks on the international seed movement that we show uh, is found better trend in the, the sense of the perspective that they used to score as a strongly negative impact. So we see the international seed uh, movement showing 20% as a strong negative impact. But still, overall, we see uh, this is still highlights as the main impact. And we found the same, I mean, concerns also on the labor, labor shortage, um, also the freight cost still high, though overall factors we see, uh, you know, is progressing in a, in a positive side. Mm -mm. Thank you, May. Indeed, yeah. a, a, a slow recovery can be seen from uh, from the impact of, uh, of last year. Okay, so we heard a little bit about the global perspective, about the Asian perspective. I'd like to zoom in a little bit on the company perspective. Arthur, um, can you share a little bit what have been the changes in the approaches or what, what kind of adaptations have uh, seed companies made, seed companies such as yours, uh, wh what have you made towards making that seed available on time to your customers? Yeah, thank you, Marcel. Uh, in fact, it was quite uh, challenging when we started out because 
it was just around the season, beginning of the season in 2020 when the pandemic struck and there was the lockdown and there's so much uncertainty. But one of the first things that happened in India, and luckily for our company and the seed industry, was that seeds was also classified and mentioned separately as part of essentials. In the past, it will always get clubbed into agriculture. So this was a great uh, help to us. And in addition to that, we had to adapt because, as mentioned, the transportation was a real challenge for us. And our costs started going up. But at the same time, we were trying to look for different ways to transport seed because we have uh, field crops as well as uh, vegetable seeds and we had to get the seed to the customer. So we quickly adapted and found different ways. We trans transported by crane, we transported by trucks and every way possible. And uh, you know, it really helped us to adjust to that situation. But having said that, it was quite challenging because uh, you know, every state had different rules because agriculture is a state subject. So we had to deal with a little bit of getting permissions for, for the transportation of the seeds. But having said that, uh, we were able to get the material there on time. So it was a real learning to adapt to a different way of operating. One of the major learnings we had was uh, from our headquarters, we were not able to really move out into the upcountry areas where we do the packing and dispatch. So a lot of, uh, you know, the handling was left to the, you know, the flow managers and the dispatch managers. And they really... The audio of Arthur. I hope uh, we can quickly solve this small technical issue. And perhaps why we are... Uh, looking into that, I would like to switch to Lian. Uh, and uh, Lian, we, we indeed saw already in Shaba's presentation that many countries were able to ensure an almost unhindered seed trade thanks to a number of policies. Uh, Lian, can you share a bit what type of policies in, in the overarching, in the whole agri-food supply chain uh, did countries implement in 2020 and also 2021? Thanks, Marcel. Yeah, I'm sort of zooming back up a bit to talk about the policy perspective from the OECD I'm because we have some. Here we are experiencing. I hear it. Uh, okay. It's okay. No, go ahead, Leanne. It's okay. Okay, thanks. Um, so, so we have at the OECD quite an extensive amount of effort going into monitoring policies. And of course, during the COVID experience, we upped our monitoring so that we could try to be um, looking in real time at what was going on. Um, we have an annual monitoring report that is published each year. We published um, the 2021 version in June on June 22nd, and it covers all the observed policy interventions that we saw last year during COVID, as well as um, other non-COVID related policies. So what we saw, what we observed is that there were almost 800 unique policy measures that were implemented by countries around the world. And about 500 of those were implemented in the, in the first four months of, of 2020. And many of those in the, in the beginning of 2020 were indeed related to um, trying to relieve uh, unexpected bottlenecks. So there was this declaration that all ag products and in many cases ag inputs were declared essential, which allowed those products to move across borders more seamlessly. There, was, there were efforts to invest in digital tools to make sure, again, that border crossings could happen even with the health restrictions that might have made it tricky. Um, there were interventions around labor, which is particularly important, of course, as everyone knows in the agriculture sector. So there were some efforts to make sure that um, um, unemployed workers who were maybe more based in urban settings could actually be used to um, move into agricultural production. Um, so we saw a really wide variety of measures implemented. About 37% of those were directed specifically to support. So this is financial support to the sector, um, including some kinds of grants to help, um, to help companies bridge the gap once, that, um, once the pandemic shot. 
hit. And about two thirds of them were temporary. So they were really sort of crisis management policies. When we look at the numbers, we saw that 157 billion US dollars were earmarked for support to agriculture and food during the COVID times. So if I can talk maybe just quickly about the, a few lessons that I think come out of our monitoring um, that could be, um, that are relevant to the seed sector. The first is, the importance of avoiding trade disruption. The second is um, keeping an eye on the periphery. If you're a map, if you're a company that's working along uh, ag or food supply chain, paying attention to some of the peripheral issues, for example, around logistics and labor. And the third is investing in um, communication, coordination, and transparency. So if I can pick up on the trade bit first, um, we also have a, a product that we produce every year that's called the Outlook, Outlook Annual Outlook. Um, we produce it with the Food and Agricultural Organization. And this report this year shows that how important trade is for food security. So we know that about 20% of all calories consumed have crossed a border. And, and I'm sure everyone in this meeting is aware that, of course, seeds also cross borders many times. So it's really critical to keep um, the agricultural sector free of distortions. And included in that, I would add um, thinking about regulations. And, and in, a, in a sense, when there's a big shock like COVID coming in, the, the, the incentive for many governments is to do, do something quickly. And that might mean to take an intervention that's unexpected that's then going to hit the private sector in ways that requires them to adjust in order to have access to that market. So, um, so what's important about this lesson is that keeping trade moving was really critical in terms of the resilience of the supply chains. And that, of course, is also relevant for seeds. The second was this, this issue of keeping an eye on the periphery. So we've had consultations with the private sector, and they talk a lot now about how the shipping sector, for example, is still having bottlenecks related to the very dramatic um, uh, decrease in demand at the at the beginning of the pandemic, and then this bounce back in demand from parts of the world as the pandemic progressed. And the shipping sector is still trying to get the ships to where they need to go, and there are holdups at ports, which then cascade all the way through. So, if, so for us, advising governments, but also um, providing. Uh, advice about policies, it's really important not just to look at the supply chain um, in terms of a one-dimensional supply chain, but also to think about the other pieces of the supply chain that affect how that supply chain moves. And then the last point I wanted to make is this importance of investing in transparency. And, and um, Chaba already gave the example of the Amos um, the Amos platform, which brings together international organizations and also countries. And what's interesting with that example is that this was set up more than a decade ago. And so there were habits of communicating, habits of sharing information, habits of um, coordinating across countries, including with um, other policymakers. And those habits were the things that were used in the moment of crisis. So the people were used to communicating. They were work used to working together effectively. And um, I think it's really important not to lose sight of the fact that um, while we all say that transparency is good, we actually have to invest in the mechanisms before we really need it. And that's one of the big lessons, I think, from the COVID experience for resilience um, in the food sector generally, but also in the seed sector. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Leanne. Uh, that was very interesting. I also see, looking at the time, it is very close to noon in Paris time. And I'm afraid, I was told you have a very important meeting at the OECD that you couldn't escape from. So you will have to, uh, to leave us now. Very sorry to see you go. Good luck with your meeting. Um, Thank you but so of much. course, we have a, a good replacement for you, and that is Mr. Shaba Gaspar. Welcome Thanks. back, Shaba. Exactly. Chava will stand in. Thanks so much. Um, then uh, we have resolved our small uh, technical issue, and I want to circle back to Arthur, because Arthur, you were sharing what adaptations that uh, seed companies have made to deal with the COVID pandemic. 
Yeah, I was uh, talking about how we had to empower downstream. Uh, the managers were on the, you know, three, four hundred kilometers away to make quick decisions. But luckily for us, we had, you know, the WhatsApp and the phones that were very helpful to call each other. And then finally, we started also using a lot of the virtual platform more than we ever did before. And we started moving to the new normal, which according to me will probably stay. A lot of it is going to stay back as a change and it will never go back to the old. So this sort of adaptation we did initially really helped us to move on uh, with the business. And that was a real learning for us because we hardly had a month's time to adapt and then prepare the dispatches and send it across. And there was all this uh, pandemic all around and a lot of uncertainty everywhere. But uh, thanks for the essentials, uh, you know, being included in the essentials, we were able to mobilize that. Yeah, that's it. Okay, thanks, Arthur. I'm going to stay with you a little bit longer yeah. um, because we, sure. we've talked about digitalization now a few mm -hmm. times. It fell in the in the presentation of uh, of Shaba, Arthur. Can you indicate a little bit how uh, a good digital platform has helped the seed industry during the pandemic? Yeah, the digital platform, in terms of uh, you know, uh, since our movements were actually restricted completely, we had to move on to the digital platforms that were available. And a lot of, in fact, uh, we had a lot of our review meetings on that. And at a later stage, we even started using the video parts to even visit some of the research plots. And a lot of our R&D managers and staff, they started even uh, exchanging information based on the visuals from the field. So that was it that we hadn't done before because always people would travel and that would take care of that. So that was a major shift, a paradigm shift actually from what we were used to earlier and when the whole organization can't really travel and you have to rely on the digital platform i think it's been a real boon to us and a lot of it once again might stay as part of our routine matters and that will also help us to cut certain unnecessary expenses we've also realized that there's a lot we can do even without traveling you know yeah mm -hmm. okay thank you arthur but of course it's it's not just the, the digital efforts in, in the seed companies mm -hmm. that have been undergoing uh, changes. And, and Shabi, mm -hmm. perhaps you can uh, share a little bit what the current status is mm. and the level of digitalization in the different regulatory areas and then specifically those regulatory areas that govern the international seed trade. Sure. And also speaking up for what, uh, what, what Santos said, I think companies today, they are using amazing tools uh, for the breeding, for the seed production, uh, uh, remote sensing, and, and basically all their quality management, quality supply chain are digitalized. So individual seeds could be traced back uh, to, the, to the original source. So it was, I think it was timely that really bit the, the regulators are, are, are picking up the pace and, and started to, to initiate uh, some, some new uh, good initiatives. And, uh, if you put this into the perspective of, of, the, uh, of, of the breeding from seed production, variety registration, seed marketing certification, so we see that, that basically, as it was said, the whole spectrum is, is, is highly regulated. Many seg segments of it are regulated by, by international uh, standards or, or, or measures in, in one kind. So there is a plenty of opportunity to, to have some um, internationally standardized digitalized platform and uh, especially if, if you are seeing from the variety protection seed production and seed marketing so if you if you go to variety protection we have uh, the UPOF convention and as we know there is a there's a prisma system which allows uh, 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 applicants uh, uh, seed companies to to file a PVP application uh, in in multiple countries with with one application. So it's absolutely streamlined uh, the uh, the variety protection system. Similarly, I think it was mentioned it's already established. If you see the the seed certification marketing side, there is a e phyto system which uh, enables the exchange of phytosanitary certificate electronically. And also uh, at OECD level. 
and there is this new initiative to to digitalize the uh, the OECD seed schemes to have a, a digital hub, which uh, which helps to communicate. Uh, uh, in, in, in the country certification system they, where they already established their system. So it's, uh, again, building on, on something existing, but, uh, but put it on a, on a more global platform. And also ISTA, with their orange certificates, mm -hmm. there are, there are, uh, there are uh, pilot programs and feasibility studies to, 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 to make it happen. So I think uh, it's, it's the right age. And, and I think, like with everything, COVID really accelerated uh, the need and all the uh, the progress that could be made in, in, in this domain. So we are really looking forward to uh, to be engaged and remain engaged. And, and as, as I think Cheba said, uh, to provide that those systems were were linked somehow because uh, those systems could, could leverage uh, from each other. So if you have uh, a variety tag and, and you scan the tag in, in a barcode scanner and you can have all the information on the varieties, uh, the variety description, whether it's PVP protected, I think it's, it's enormously uh, gives a, a, a kind of security to the seed trade. So uh, for fraud and counterfeit seeds, it will be more difficult because uh, you have a real-time system to, to check all those information. And also from, from this, this traceability aspects uh, uh, to, to provide statistics for, uh, for, for the government will make uh, this flow much more easier than today. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are many aspects which uh, we are just uh, discovering and uh, we are very glad to see that these organizations, these international organizations are really partnering with the seed industry to build mm -hmm. these, these kind of systems. Okay, that's, that's very great to hear. Thanks, Shabi. And we have a question coming in from the audience. This is a question to you, Shabi. Uh, and it's a question from uh, Philippe Lezigne from Bayer. Uh, Shabi, what are the key areas that our international seed sector organizations will focus on even more so than before uh, to address the challenges faced? You mean the, the, the pandemic, pandemic phase? Absolutely, yep. I think it's the, the level of cooperation, the level of cooperation, what we need to build, uh, build our, our regulators. I think uh, this showed us that uh, we are in a, in, a, in a global system, so we cannot really focusing on, on, on areas which are um, just addressing specific uh, uh, national uh, problems because uh, uh, and this is not just because of the pandemic. We have the other challenges, is, which is really uh, showing the need for further diversification. And further diversification our, our, our seed supply chain to, to really mitigate the risk. Uh, uh, whether, this can be any type of risk. So it could be weather risk, it can be political program, economical crisis. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the seed and the breeding, it's, it's, you cannot afford not to uh, supply farmers with seed in individual years. So this is what breeders are doing today and have to do it more so in the future uh, to try to di diversify their breeding pro programs, uh, their, their seed supply, seed production, and also the trade. I think this is the, this is the bad ad advice, best advice uh, could be given uh, to, to, these, to these problems mm -hmm. we are facing today. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, very good advice. Thanks, Xavi. Um, but of course, uh, apart from all these wonderful plans and, and roads ahead, adoption of these plans and really implementing all the d digital efforts is another thing. And Shaba, I, I would like to, uh, to check in with you a little bit. Uh, can you share what we have seen in terms of adoption of the various digital tools in the agro-food supply chain in 20 and 2021. Thank you, uh, Marcel. Um, I'm not sure if I understood your question correctly. So uh, you wanted to hear some information about things or what could be your... Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Shaba. Um, but I've also picked up on the fact that there are quite different uh, levels in the implementation of digitalization between countries. 
on the one side and between companies on the other side we're seeing countries where the digitalization efforts are very far advanced and on the other side we are also seeing um, countries and companies where that is not yet the case. Um, Artur, I'm, I'm going to check in with you. Can you uh, share a little bit um, what efforts have been made to bridge the digital device and how um, companies perhaps could increase the access to the internet? Yeah, I feel uh, the digital divide has to be, the gap has to be closed across the, you know, markets, across the villages, because this is the age of information. And uh, access to information and access to the digital platform has gone beyond uh, just uh, companies and individuals and businesses. It has to permeate downstream right to the level of the farmers, because today a lot of activity is happening digitally and as a result the access to this it's almost like a, a right for everyone to have it but of course there are challenges in the rolling out the digital the connectivity issues are there but my suggestion uh, i mean at least from the indian perspective would be that we have a lot of great companies that are really working on establishing more and more access to the digital platform and ag internet access so those companies will have to have an inclusive approach and consider that uh, the field of agriculture and especially specifically the seed industry uh, must be included in that approach so that everybody connected with this field can also have access and in addition to that everyone other than the seed industry anyway they're going to have the access but what i'm trying to hear uh, say here is that the internet access is going to become more and more critical as we move and it's also going to increase the speed of business because the decision making processes and the information flow can be speeded up and thereby it will also ultimately impact the ease of doing business i mean this is what i the way i look at it thank you thank you artur uh, but we realize of course that all these efforts also cost a lot of money and shaba i i want to come back to you um in your view shaba what types of investments have contributed to resilient food systems thank you master so uh, in, in our view is it's very important uh, uh, this is the for us, the digitalization is the high priority at the moment, but not only the seed sector, but in general in the uh, agricultural sector, because consumers also want to see uh, how the food was produced at the end. So uh, all of the food sector is working on that, and this is a, a high investment there. Digitalization is, I think, is one of the most uh, priority here. And what is important that if the seed uh, sector can join to the digitalization of the international food sector, that would be also a great advantage for us, because then it would be really a uh, farm to fork uh, digital traceability it could be established if we are integrating ourselves to that uh, system. So I think that that would be uh, the most important uh, investment at the moment, what we learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. Thanks, Shaba. Um, I'm hearing a lot of changes, a lot of efforts, both on the side of countries and on the side of companies, but all these changes cannot have been easy. Arthur, uh, from a seed company perspective, can you share a bit how things like inventory management or forecasting uh, among uh, seed companies have been impacted by the pandemic? Yeah, Marcel, I feel uh, it's really impacted inventory management in, a, you know, in, a, in ways beyond which we had imagined earlier. You know, uh, back in the 70s and 80s, many companies would always carry excess inventory of fast-moving products so that they would never run out of it and the customers would be able to get it. And moreover, just producing it 
uh, a good product going to the field over and over, over for production was always uh, a challenge so we would do it and store it but then we got into the 90s and after the 2000 and the inventory carrying was just enough just in time and that was a different approach but today when you have the uncertainty back on this on the radar i feel uh, the you know carrying inventory we like in our company some of the products we've decided that we are going to go for a 24 month uh, availability because we don't know you know if there's another lockdown or if the you know the uncertainty factor is so high that we might have to take a risk so we've decided yes okay well, wherever we have sure short products we carry a lot of inventory but that is domestic. Now, coming to the international production, for example, if we are doing some production overseas in some of the southern hemisphere countries, then that we feel that it's even higher risk because of international movement of material where we might need to, need to again carry more inventory. But the only challenge that uh, many seed industry colleagues will understand is that when you're carrying inventory, you have to be really uh, sure about the product and that it's worthwhile carrying inventory of certain SKUs so that, uh, you know, and, and from that angle, your forecasting has to be very accurate. You'll have to go with enough data and maybe a little bit of gut feeling so that, uh, you know, you, you, you've made the right decision because uh, the data, the qualitative data is another challenge uh, during these times, but we're hoping now with the vaccinations and all uh, things will start changing for the positive. But definitely as of now, probably another 12 months to 24 months, we would carry more inventory than we have traditionally have in the last five years. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Arthur. Um, several uh, efforts and different um, practices have been tried and tested. And I'd like to go back to May. May, um, seeing all these efforts, I'm sure we have been able to learn from those various uh, different uh, initiatives that have been tried. From your point of view, May, would you be able to recommend any best practices to the companies to cope with the situation? Well, well actually, this is also the same question that we have uh, collected from our seed company members, and they have shared so many good practices and similar to what uh, Mr. Santosh Atua has mentioned. So I can help to share, you know, uh, in each area that they have shared the best practices. Perhaps some companies can adopt that also. So of course they put very good protocol on the sanitation for the employee who need to work at the site. So they, they provide very good, uh, you know, PPE and also very good checkpoint. And for, they also put the, you know, the, a better policy for work from home and some companies also they support like internet package for the employees. So moving for the aspects of the marketing plan, uh, marketing, you know, the, the planning for the marketing camp campaign, they of course start to use the digital platform to demonstrate uh, the feel or the performance of the new variety to introduce to the market. And more on, of that, they also provide very good like application or the tools to connect with the farmers so that they can help to give the agronomic practices to the farmers. And similar to what uh, Mr. Santos mentioned about inventory management, so I would not, uh, you know, again, repeat on that point, but of course they plan better on the next season of planting, especially the, the movement of the parental lines. So these are all the recommendations that we have gathered from our members. And I do believe that this is very useful also for the seed companies uh, right now that they are still co coping with the, the pandemic. Thanks, Marcel. Thanks, May. Those are some very important recommendations and, and, and good luck with the implementation at, at the national level. But of course, we also heard earlier in Shaba's presentation that uh, all these efforts and, and all the methods and, 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 and rules changes uh, to cope with the uh, pandemic uh, were, of course, a bit easier in developed countries. And Arthur, I, I want to come back uh, with you about developing countries. How can developing countries work on improving the local seed production and, and their supply systems? 
Yeah, that's a good question. You know, there was earlier mention about uh, um, about nationalizing the you know seeds uh, industry or uh, part of it, and uh, going back to that aspect. The first thing, uh, smaller entrepreneur companies and startup companies and youngsters, they need to understand the fundamentals really well if they want to develop local supply chain systems and have a better understanding of the, you know, the agroclimatic zones that are required to produce good seed. One of the challenges sometimes is you would like to produce a temperate crop in a region where it's not possible. And that's where the, even the, I mean, uh, this is uh, in, uh, co connected in a way, the policy is important for that. But coming back to that, I think today with the information available everywhere and so many, you know, institutions, are making so much of uh, information available to young entrepreneurs and those establishing supply systems that it's a lot easier than, than it was in the past. I think even several organizations like the OECD and several others are coming forward with a lot of information that they are sharing so that people can benefit and um, new supply chain production can be taken up in, in many countries across the world. And I believe that's the need of the hour where you're going to become self-sufficient. And to become self-sufficient in seeds, you'll have to first establish a proper supply chain for which you need the science to go with it and you need the temperament uh, to develop it. But it's possible and today there are more tools available and uh, once again, integrating the digital part and uh, you know most of the access to information that's available over there, I feel out there, I mean, in, on the internet and on uh, several other platforms, it, it is necessary and it can be possible over a period of time to do this capacity building uh, in startup uh, firms and startup companies and individuals who want to take it to the next level in terms of supply chain, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Arthur. And the questions keep uh, coming in um, from, the, from the live Q&A. And to our audience, if you have any questions to our panelists, please uh, make sure you type those questions into the, the Q&A function, and I will be receiving those in front of me. Um, we've heard quite a bit about the global seed supply chain. And I want to um, circle back to Shabi. Shabi, the global seed supply chain, do we really need it? Yeah, this is a good question, Marcel. I think we are challenged as a seed industry. We are challenged as an international organization that uh, what is the right response, why we are doing it. And uh, we are s often criticized that it's, uh, it's purely uh, a profitable issue. We are producing seeds in country because there is a uh, there is cheap labor. And, and this issue is much more complex to that. So I think the, the assumption or the, the, the baseline, what um, Chaba already said in, in, in their conclusion, that today there is no country who can supply their farmers from, from their own production. So uh, seed companies are, are breeding, trialing, producing seeds uh, all over the world. Uh, to mitigate uh, 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 a cer certain risk. So, um, so there are many elements. It's, it's not just the, the labor issue. The first is, is gain efficiency. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are traditionally uh, countries, regions who have expertise on, on crops, producing the crop and the seeds. They have the, the right infrastructure, the right equipment, and uh, the traditional knowledge. So we need to leverage uh, th this knowledge very much. Also and I think many people don't think about it, but the biology of the crop. So sometimes the seed production, the producing seeds uh, efficiently needs a different day length, different uh, uh, temperature than the crop itself. So uh, the country is not capable of, of, of producing certain crops of, of seeds because uh, there is the climate is not uh, really uh, 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 adapted for it. So. The, the second uh, after efficiency is the uh, um, 
the, the seed supply, the, the security of the seed supply. And I think I already mentioned about that. It's the mitigating, especially the, 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 the climate uh, problem, the weather problems, which we know it's getting more extreme. So I think uh, uh, this, this type of uh, risk mitigation uh, will be absolutely needed uh, in the future as well. And seed stability and seed supply stability is uh, uh, it's absolutely connected to, to increased food security. So uh, partially because you diversify your seed production, you, so you, be, you can be sure that in the end you can provide farmers for the seeds, but also with this global seed supply, you can, you can offer a wide variation of, of different type of mm -hmm. seed, which are mostly locally updated varieties which farmers can choose, choose from. And potentially the, the last but not least is the uh, uh, to, to have in this way this kind of cooperation because it's, it's many occasions, it's a, based on cooperation on, on an international company with the local company, so it's a very intensive knowledge transfer. So this is how you can teach and educate uh, uh, people in different countries in some best practices which has already come on in other countries. So I think it's a very important element uh, to have this kind of very lively cooperation between private and public companies and, mm -hmm. and, and make sure that this, this knowledge will be transferred to, to, to other regions as well. Mm -hmm. So it's, I said it's, it's, it's a very complex issue uh, and it's more than just a, a labor cost. Mm -hmm. Sure, the, uh, and this seems like a very good list to make sure that the global mm. seed supply chain stays in place, but I'm, I, I think there are some challenges as well, right? Yeah, of course there are challenges. So it's our different, I think we are living in, the, in an international uh, atmosphere. So we know about problems of uh, time zones and languages, and so there are all kinds of barriers, but I think uh, with this, especially with these new technological tools, I think it's easy to, to overcome. For me, the the biggest challenge is absolutely the regulatory challenge. So we know that uh, uh, when a seed produced, it's not really known the, the final destination. So uh, there are certain type of phytosanitary regulation to needs to fulfill. Um, there are quality requirements. So, and it's not always uh, consistent in, in every country. So I think what we need to, to maintain this, this global supply chain is, is the consistent regulation for, for all kind of areas. And uh, as I said, in, in many areas we have uh, international frameworks and standards, but there are others area where we are lacking, or are others where we have, but it's not, uh, uh, um, consistently implemented in different countries. So for me, it's absolutely the, the compliance of, of, of national regulation and, mm -hmm. and sometimes distortion in the regulation is the, the biggest hurdle uh, for this uh, mm -hmm. global supply chain. Absolutely, thanks Shabi. And I'm sure ISF will be working very hard absolutely. to overcome those challenges, great. Um, I've been hearing a lot about the past year, looking back at 2020, and here's a question that came in from the chat, uh, which is directed to May. May, what are the expected problems in the seed supply chain that we can foresee for the remainder of 2021 and perhaps also beyond? Yeah, I, uh, well, we still see that, of course, the international seed movement is still a major challenge in our region. However, we, we see that, uh, you know, at least the domestic market, uh, uh, the companies can still doing quite well on that. I do not think that overall picture of the global seed movement would be having again a big impact as compared to the last year in that because the government you know start to learn and some countries also start to fa uh, facilitate the work for the private sector in terms of the you know the laboratory testing uh, phytosanitary certificates however we still see that you know as Right now, it's quite uncertain in some countries, especially in Asia Pacific region. Of course, we see the situation right now with the with the vaccine, and, you know, and that we, the way we mitigate the risk also for the seed industry. However, we we hope we hope that of course the labor shortage still foresee, but hope that uh, you know it would not be worse as uh, we we found in the last year. And so, yeah, that would be the, the trend that we foresee um, until the end of this year, myself. Thanks, May. 
That's great. Um, Shaba, I, uh, I'd like to come back to you. Uh, we've been talking a lot about the challenges that the pandemic has posed on the agri-food uh, change and ways how to overcome them. In your recent study that you mentioned at the beginning, what were some of the key lessons towards resilience of the agri-food chain? Thank you, Marcel, for the question. Yes, uh, the agri-food scene, of course, they were affected by the COVID-19, uh, similar to the seed sector. But there are different aspects of this, uh, how it affected the, the food supply chain. The first one is the angle of food nutrition, so food security aspect. Um, that was a, a challenge, uh, but uh, <clears throat> it was very important to uh, keep the global food supply chain open and accessible so that the food can arrive to the consumers in time. So that was a great challenge, similar to the seed sector as well. And that's why um, the agriculture sector was regarded as essential sector in, in most of the countries. It was very important to maintain the transparency of the food supply chain. Uh, even I would say more important than in the seed sector, because we were talking about uh, providing food for people. So policymakers were very sensitive about this availability of this information and also the tra transparency of the food market. Um, it was also important uh, to find cooperative uh, solutions between different countries, because some of the countries, they restricted in export of food. So other countries uh, were in the trouble if they wanted to, they needed uh, food, imported food for the supplying uh, the uh, um, uh, citizens with uh, enough food. Uh, the policy answers were like speeding up uh, the policy border control and to ensure the smooth uh, uh, cross-border trade between the countries. And as I said, uh, to declare that uh, agriculture is an essential sector, so the production could ongo uh, in this way. The, the second part was the livelihood uh, for farmers, because uh, the restrictions affected uh, uh, how the farmers could not sell uh, some of the products, uh, food products, because uh, the, there was a decrease in demand for so, uh, see, uh, food uh, su uh, service uh, suppliers, so like restaurants, they were closed down. So many of the, that was a surplus of food uh, on the market and perishable products had to be uh, uh, destroyed. Also, it was some cases when uh, like meat factories were closed down. So uh, animals, they needed to, killed or it was an euthanasia kind of uh, thing. So that was not really uh, a good solution. Uh, so to be able to support the food producers, the government uh, took different measures. For example, uh, flexibility on granting uh, or increasing, extending deadlines for applying uh, um, the subsidies, for example, so the financial aspect was very important to, to support the, the companies and food producers to get enough money to maintain the basic food producing capacities. So then once the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic finished, they will be able to produce the same amount of food. Uh, so they, it was like a short term measure, not to jeopard, jeopardizing the long term goal. Uh, of the of the policies, uh, yeah. So so that was really the key uh, issues. So it was very similar, but I would say it was even more sensitive uh, for the governments to solve or to not to ensure the seed supply is uh, remain uh, intact. Thanks, Shaba. Very important uh, recommendations there. Um, Arthur, I, I'd like to, um, to come back to you. 
and talk a little bit more about the harmonization of rules. Xavi uh, already mentioned that uh, a little bit, and I, sometimes I compare it with uh, with the soccer. Uh, we are in the in the soccer uh, period right now with the UEFA Euro 2020 tournament and Copa America, and it only works because everybody plays by the same rules. So the same rules towards uh, the soccer game, but also in the seed trade that would uh, apply. What, how will the harmonization of rules and regulations and policies across countries help towards a smoother movement of seeds in your Asia Pacific region? Yeah, thank you, Marcel. Yeah, I believe that uh, harmonization is the way forward with alignment of uh, policies between countries that are you know, international, having international trade in terms of seeds, because uh, this is very much needed so that the seed gets supplied on time and there's a smooth flow of uh, material, you know, seed material. If the seed material keeps getting blocked on the way, it might miss a season or you might have so many challenges which uh, sometimes uh, can be sorted by harmonization of law and alignment of policies with the countries that we are in, in business with or in trade with. Because let's remember, let's not forget that on one side there's a farmer who's producing the seed to be used by a farmer on the other side of the world. And then if there are no enabling policies you know, it, it, it really becomes difficult to do business, commerce, because uh, sometimes I feel if uh, two countries or three countries that are operating can sit together and come up with policies that are conducive, it's very important. And that's where harmonization is important. And those countries that still need to understand how things work at a global level can sit with the, the you know, fellow countries, look at the production, look at your pest risk analysis, phyto requirements, and then bring in a smoother system. And I believe uh, the APSA is doing a lot of work to you know, bring this sort of harmonization, and it's very, it's very much required. Because uh, in this day and age, on one side, you have people who are producing food, and on the other side, you have a policy that's uh, not helping the movement of seeds, so that's a contradictory. So I feel over a period of time, if the harmonization can happen in our region and between regions that we work with outside of, you know, our uh, Asia Pacific and South Asia region, I think it's needed intra and inter country so that, you know, it really then puts everything together. So I believe harmonization is the way forward and governments and poli policy makers should really consider it seriously and apply themselves and ensure that there is a ease of uh, doing business and that uh, you know our license to operate is smoother than it is sometimes because of these cha challenges excuse me thanks arthur i heard you say harmonization is the way forward i think that could be our new motto for the various national and regional seed association i fully agree uh, we have a few minutes left in May. Uh, we have another question coming in here in the live chat. Uh, May, do you have any recommendations for a smooth and global, smooth global and regional sea trade? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Marcel. This is a very important uh, question. And I think that this needs a long-term focus, uh, you know, from the regional perspective and from international. So from the international level, I believe that, of course, uh, harmonization is still required. However, in the I would just focus more on the Asia Pacific region, taking example of uh, APSA, the way that we start to collaborate with our stakeholders to work with NPDO in each country this year. So what are we planning is very long term process because we start to be aware of this uh, you know, regulation and also harmonization of the phytosanitary regulation. So. We, this year, we start to again do the questionnaires to start checking the current um, you know, capacity of each country because in Asia Pacific, there are 
quite different in terms of the practices from you know one country to another country. So how can we bring or lift uh, or help to build capacity of the countries that they still now you know do not have the same level of the policy um, you know measures or the I mean measurements compared to another country. So that's how we are focusing. So the the plan is that we will work again. Uh, well, we continue our work with NPPL and we link with International State Federation, with uh, ASTA, with Crop Life Asia, with also APARI to work on this with uh, our um, NPPLs, and we also link with Asia Pacific Plant Protection Organization because this takes long-term plan not just only you know one and two years to complete so our focus is still on the pet risk analysis how can we harmonize that and that of course we get a support from the ISF, ISF after you know they publish the regulated test list and we can have NPO learning from that and besides we also need to work on how can we facilitate the capacity of the seed health laboratory of the countries in Asia Pacific and this is very important um, and also, we would like to request that, you know, uh, the countries should not put a restrictive methods to the specific disease because it's very hard for seed company to set their plan or adjust their work accordingly because, you know, they may lose one year, one season, and that would also a factor to delay a seed to deliver to the, to the farmers. And yeah, uh, there's so many good uh, initiatives that we have worked together, together with our stakeholders. I think that we are going to keep, um, you know, reporting on the development also to our, uh, of course, our newsletter and also all the channels of uh, our seed association. Thank you. And if you have more questions, of course, uh, I'm happy to answer after this session is done also. Thank you. Mm -mm. Thanks, May, very important. Uh, we are almost at the time, so uh, Shabi, I'm going to give the last question to you, and you have 30 seconds for it. Great progress being made, but we're not there yet. Can you expand a little bit on the challenges that still remain for the international sea trade? Yeah, I think when we are got this kind of uh, this the survey from APSA and we are doing our our questionnaire, I think what was very interesting and a little bit funny that uh, basically those areas uh, uh, where already we have challenges have been amplified by the COVID where we had mm -hmm. to solve anyway. So this is phytosanitary, export Im import permits, uh, uh, non-tariff uh, barriers and, and measures from certain countries. So, so basically nothing is new, just uh, with the COVID it has been amplified uh, to, uh, and mm -hmm. it was a higher magnitude. So I think uh, be, uh, together our partners, as, as, as May said, we have to work together to, to basically combat those challenges which has been a little bit now, now stressed us and, and confronted us mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in a higher level. But we are basically dealing with these, these same issues uh, in, a, in our day-to-day -day business. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Shabi. Um, looking at the time, I'm afraid that's all that we have for today. A big, big thanks to our panelists of today, Shaba, May, Arthur, Leanne, and Shabi here in the studio. And of course, a big thanks to our audience for listening and for your active participation in the live chat. I hope you found it interesting and valuable and do enjoy the rest of the ISF Congress.
Welcome. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to our speech. Kimbre reporting from Stockerau. My name is Franz Verana. I'm a key account manager and Cluster Lead Americas. And together with my, with my colleague, Andreas Fröhlich, Cluster Lead uh, for Dach and Balkan region, we're going to show you and introduce you the first uh, compact C processing line plug-in version. But before we start into the technical section, I would like to give you a little insight about our new phase, Kimbre, a new phase. We have done our homework during this demanding time. Um, and would like to show you one thing. Please, next slide. Uh, our, our complete echo at clients. We are together uh, uh, covering many big uh, brands like Walter, Challenger, Fant, Masse Ferguson, and our part, Grain and Protein, where we are at home in Kimbria. Next slide, please. Actually, uh, our Grain and Protein brand is covering uh, Kimbria, GSI in the, in, the, in the storage and seed processing section, as well AP for swine solutions, and Cumberland and Deco uh, for uh, poultry and egg solutions. Next slide, please. And here, our new words, our mission, our vision. With us, you have an expert at your side. Actually, uh, we're covering the whole world uh, with our dealers, agents, and area managers uh, all over the world. And uh, we're dedicated to your success and to your growth. And together, um, uh, in the last 70, 70 years, we have developed and built a lot of uh, knowledge and experience in our fields. With our colleagues, 900 people, we are doing in 18 locations our great job for you customers. And together, we have built 60,000 installations worldwide for the last decades. Next slide. We are complete. We round up the whole the whole sector from uh, a solutions together. We will provide you a complete turnkey solution where you have had a class, no no doubts and no issues. We will guide you through everything. We go you through as one team uh, with uh, reliable delivery times, expert installations, seamless connections and uh, our keeper promise is that you will be happy and you will perform with your plants perfectly next slide please our main our main plants or, or what are we doing we are doing seed processing grain storage feed milling food processing the complete ear corn processing, corn processing uh, 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 plants we are giving you in Turkey. Of course, also green coffee processing is one of the well developing sections in our fields. Then, not to forget the big port terminals at the seasides as well big rivers. And all this together uh, bounded with our internal control and automatization system in order to give you the best insight into your plants with the most efficient way to run your plants. Next slide, please. What we do, of course, our knowledge, our experience, we also test inside. We have our test and training uh, uh, labs in our facilities, actually, on the one hand, to develop, to test, 
do see do receive your demands to check how we can solve your issues your problems and of course at the end of the day you are welcome to visit us in our lab stations for trainings and development of your uh, operators next slide please our main columns are drying, conveying, processing, optical sorting, and storage. These are our performance-driven products. In the next slides, we'll see what it is. Next slide, please. We have the best in class in drying solutions, such as continuous dryers, directly heated, indirectly heated, of course, also cup dryers, single, double, triple pass. Not to forget our tent toasters and uh, drum dryers, which actually uh, used to, to, uh, to dry on high, high uh, temperature for sterilization, for drying different grain types. Of course, all the equipment is equipped by our fans. Quality conveying solutions. All our plants, of course, are connected with our in-house conveyors. Low maintenance, no downtimes, and of course, perfectly fit into your plants capacity-wise. And one big topic for our seed guys for sure is gentle seed handling. We get up every morning with gentle seed handling and germination in our ads. Next slide, please. Seed processing. We're not just doing a couple handful of machines. We're providing a complete solution. We cover grading, cleaning, sorting, gravity separation, color sorting, and of course, treatment. So the complete process we can cover with our uh, product portfolio. And of course, for all types of seeds, we can give you that. Next slide, please. Then, not to forget, and very important, and a great addition to our product portfolio, our in-house optical sorters. Actually, we develop them and do our own R&D. We have a big range of different sorters with the latest state of art uh, sorting and detecting technologies. Programming programs and everything will, is up, will be updated or updated every year again and again. So they're really latest state of art. Next slide, please. One of our main columns is industrial storage. We have our square silo systems as well as the round silo systems. They are all, of course, administrated by our temperature monitoring system, which uh, secure your products in the silo systems. Of course, in addition also our inventory management system to know how much is inside, very important in this fast moving time nowadays. And this all, of course, covered by an unmatched service. We are doing remote connections. We have done this very successfully in this last one and a half years. Due to COVID, we couldn't travel. So we had a very great experience with our remote services. We, of course, do startup and on-site trainings. We have our spare part kits. Of course, we offer preventive maintenance services uh, in a contract frame and the 24 uh, our seven days technical assistance availability. Um, thank you for the attention. I will now overhand to my colleague Andreas for the container presentation. Thank you very much for listening. The world is changing fast and so is the seed and food processing industry. Flexibility, just-in-time productivity, competitive costs and quick return on investment are key success factors. Kimbria works relentlessly to be a step ahead, offering customized solutions to meet market demands. That's why Kimbria has developed the global first compact processing plant. Tested, fully assembled and shipped worldwide in a container. The necessary footprint of the installation is very small. All the necessary equipment and auxiliaries are on board, including conveyors, aspiration, automatic PLC with finished wiring, compressed air and vacuum system. The container plant can process several crops and is available in different setups for seed, maize, sunflowers, beans and coffee processing. Its mobility opens the door for lease contract financing. 
The most attractive thing about this plug-and-play solution is the on-site installation, which takes only two to three days upon arrival. A Kimbria technical supervisor will work shoulder to shoulder with you during assembly, immediately perform startup, and train your operators. Now, let's get this amazing plant started. The plant can be filled from big bags or boxes. The self-emptying intake pit collects the seed, and the inclined belt conveyor gently transports them into the processing line, preventing seed damage. After passing through the pipe magnet to remove harmful metallic particles, the seeds enter the flat screen cleaner to sort out big and small impurities as well as light particles. Thanks to its unique movement, the Delta Cleaner allows each kernel to contact the screen surface multiple times, resulting in excellent cleaning and sorting performance. Multiple settings allow the best adjustment for any crop. The indented cylinder then takes out short and long impurities. The adjustable rotary speed and specially shaped pockets enable the removal of particles of the wrong length. Generous access to the machine allows for easy changing of segments. As a final cleaning step, the gravity separator removes light seeds with low germination ability. Its sophisticated air dispersal system, adjustable fan drive, as well as the useful pins, bars and maximizer, ensure the best separation by specific weight of any separator on the market. The Kimbria compact plant is the ideal solution for a wide range of seed and crops like maize and sunflowers. For these products, a flat screen grader will replace the indented cylinder to sort the seed into the required amounts. In addition to the gravity separator, a color sorter is installed in the plant for such crops. Thanks to Kimbria's superior full-color cameras and the latest NIR, in-gas and UV technologies, any discolored kernels can be removed with excellent results. After these cleaning and separation steps, the chemical treater applies liquid agents to protect the seeds from fungi, pests and insects after sowing. For maize and sunflowers, a batch treater is applied. All the treating processes are fully automatic for ultimate distribution of the valuable agents at the highest safety standards. The conveying equipment runs at very low speed to gently convey the valuable seed without the danger of breakage or reduction of germination capacity. All finalized seed is packaged in big bags or in small paper or plastic bags, depending on your requirements. In both cases, the sophisticated electronic scales ensure the precise weight. The plant cleaning is extremely easy, thanks to the onboard vacuum and compressed air systems. All are designed for quick operation in a very comfortable way. Processing waste can be emptied into bags in the bottom container or collected by mobile screw conveyors. The whole plant is equipped with a sophisticated cyclofan aspiration system removing the dust from the air, which is then exhausted into the atmosphere. Upon request, Kimbria can offer a containerized filter plant. The Kimbria Compact plant represents a real revolution in the processing industry and will provide many new opportunities for our customers. Kimbria, together we feed the world. So, hello everybody out there. My name is Andreas Fröhlich. I have been working for Kimbria almost 20 years now. I'm the cluster lead for Dach and Balkans region. And today it's my pleasure to do the technical deep, deep dive into our new compact processing plants with you. So if we start the presentation, please. Next slide. This one is really the first plug-and-play processing plant in the market. It is 100% pre-tested here and then delivered to the customer after a complete test run with product. The basic structure of the system is two 40-foot high cube containers stacked on top of each other. 
we have a central vacuum cleaning system inside so to do quick and, and thorough cleaning of the plant. In front of each machine on the containers we have a double door so to grant perfect access for both cleaning service and also for doing the settings on the machines. A catwalk in front of the upper container will also give access to all the machines on the top container with a convenient staircase. The finishing can be customized, so on one hand we can offer a diesel generator to enable the system to also operate in very remote areas with no sufficient uh, electric connection. And as stated in the video, we can also offer filter plants to run these systems in urban areas. To give you an overview on the whole system, on the left side we have the intake pit with an inclined belt conveyor, then the stacked conveyors with the catwalk and the staircase in front, and on the right side we see the cyclofan. Next slide. The double doors in front of each processing machine, so we have three double doors per container. Next slide. And finally, this is the appearance of the system where you can see the processing machinery in the top container. And then in the bottom container, we have the chemical treatment, the packaging, and all the auxiliaries like the vacuum cleaning system, the compressed air system, and the PLC control unit. Next slide, please. All of these plants are built in-house in Kimbrea. So we do the whole installation, we do the whole pre-wiring, and then finally we set it up for a complete test run with customer's product. Next slide. The core components of the plant is the intake system in the beginning with an intake pit for big bags or seat boxes, followed by an inclined belt conveyor, then a screen cleaner, subsequently an indented cylinder. This one will be applied in the serial version. In the maize and legumes plant, it will be replaced by a flat screen grader. Next machine is then the gravity separator to remove light impurities with low germination ability followed by a color sorter in the maize and legume setup. And then we go to the chemical treatment. This would be a continuous treater in the serial version or a batch treater for corn and legumes. The packing can be a big bag filling or a bagging into small paper bags or a combination of both. So this is quickly interchangeable. The PLC system and the vacuum cleaning system included, as well as the compressed air system, and then finally the cyclofan for aspiration, which can be replaced by a filter plant. Next slide, please. The overall appearance with the main components starting round the clock, so just to repeat that, we have the intake system, a pipe magnet to remove uh, metallic particles and therefore to protect the plant from any damage and also to, to handle the ATEX topics, the fine cleaning machine, the indented cylinder, gravity separation, the aspiration system to the right, the chemical treatment, packaging, vacuum cleaning system, compressed air system, and the PLC control overall. Next slide. The next version we have would be the compact maze plant. On that one we see the indented cylinder is replaced by a screen grader and the chemical treater is not a continuous one but a batch version. And we have the color sorter in addition. Next slide. The advantages that we see in this system is first of all, it comes fully pre-assembled and tested. So the installation on site will take you two maximum through three days and you can be absolutely sure the system is working from the first second without any bad surprises. We don't need any extra platforms. So the container in which the plant is being transported is the platform for the plant already. The whole system is very easy to clean, so generous access and all the cleaning equipment on board with the vacuum system and the compressed air system. 
electric installation on site is as easy as it can be. So it is seven to eight cables you have to connect. The plug connections cannot even be mixed up. So this is something everybody can do within a few minutes. We have a very limited space demand on the whole thing. So the footprint is extremely compact. We don't have any specific building requirements. All we need for the plant is, in fact, a straight surface of asphalt or concrete and a shed. The plants are suitable for a large variety of different seeds. So we have the cereal version, we have the corn and legumes version, and then also the coffee version. Optionally, we can offer the filter plant for urban areas, as stated before. One very important point, the plant is portable, so this will open the door definitely for leasing financing, and we have done that before already. All the housekeeping equipment on board, so keeping the plant clean, making your operators clean the plant frequently is as easy as it can be. The whole thing comes CE marked, so the entire plant will have a, a CE mark, ma uh, marking as a deeply linked system. The cost-benefit ratio in that one is totally optimized, so this one will really help you get a return on investment very quickly. The design of it is unique, so this is also really something for the eye compared to other installations. The spare part package for the core machinery, as well as all user manuals, are included. We have the manuals on the switchboard, so on the PLC. Additionally, to the two main containers, we will supply two extra containers, which contain all the auxiliary equipment. And that one can later on be even used as storage facility for screens, for segments, and so on. And finally, the chemical room can be heated, so the viscosity of your liquids will be permanently in the right range. Next slide, please. Now going into the details of the machinery involved. First of all, the flat screen cleaner with its shaker feeder is adjustable in speed, so capacity can be regulated, and it is self-emptying, which is extremely important for genuine handling and seed purity. The pre and after suction system work uniform over the entire width, so that means perfect aspiration of light particles. And we have electrical adjustment of all the air flaps, so this is very precise to adjust and reproducible. The screens have a large area on one hand, so seven square meters in this container system, and we have a ball cleaning system working extremely gentle and effective. Next slide, please. The extra screens will be supplied in screen racks, so you have perfect storage of these, clear arrangement, and you really can simply take out the screens, exchange them in the machine, so perfect overview for the operator. The machine itself has changeable screen diagrams, which is really easy to do, just taking some trays out putting other trays in, and that makes it extremely versatile for different crops. Next slide. Typical waste we can see from a flat screen cleaner, so with pre and after suction system, taking out light particles, rough waste from the top screen, small weeds, thin kernels from the bottom screen. Next slide. Next machine in here is the indented cylinder. We have the slidable safety covers, which give quick access to the machine and perfect safety for your operators. The cylinders are made of three segments, so that makes it quick to remove them and, and also easy for the operator without carrying too heavy load. The segments themselves have a very high number of pockets in the way we produce them. So this increases the sorting ability, the sorting efficiency, and in addition, we use specially shaped pockets for round grain sorting and another type of pockets for the long grain sorting. Next slide. Rotary speed of the cylinders is always adjustable due to movie mods from SCW. The retarder on the long grain cylinder can be adjusted from the outside, so to have perfect setting for the long grain separation and to reduce the loss of any good kernels as far as possible. 
Sample taker openings give quick access so that you can permanently check the result of the indent cylinder, of course, placed in a safe way so to prevent any injuries. Next slide. Typical waste from indented cylinders would be small weeds and broken kernels on the left-hand side, and long grain would typically be kernels with on, still on, um, straw, and also wild oats. Next slide. Gravity separator finally has a really distinguished air dispersal system, which is unique in the market. So this helps you for precise adjustment of the machine and gives you highest purity in the clean product. The patented counterbalancing system takes care of smooth operation, therefore giving a long lifetime to the machine. And of course, it reduces vibration to the structure and here to the container significantly. So you won't feel this machine in the container. Feeding devices along with aspiration systems having an electromagnetic feeder for, for easy adjustment of capacity, the dust hoods for removal of dust, and of course, partial dust hoods reducing the amount of air aspirated significantly. Next slide. The maximizer on the deck helps to, to do the setting, especially in the light product area, very precisely. We have further features on the deck, like the pins for stratification and for having a faster separation on the deck, these uh, ribs to, to remove or to, to reduce good product or to prevent good product going down to the light product side. And of course, the stone trap to additionally remove stones and doing partially the job of a de-stoner even. And finally, the light product hopper, which is designed in a way to make it extremely easy to, to decide what will be light product, what is mixed product, what is heavy product. Next slide. Then the color sorter. What we have here is a multi-channel configuration. So, for example, in the corn plant, we can run two grades parallelly, one on the left shoot, one on the right shoot. It is very user-friendly these days to do all the settings. So everything is done on the screen live. You just click the defects. So it was never as simple as it is today. The RGB cameras, which have near human eye spectrum, so they see the colors that our human eye can see. We have an optical resolution of less than one-tenth of a millimeter therefore detection of even smallest defects possible. Next slide, please. The LED backgrounds have a very low energy demand these days compared to old systems. Therefore, lifetime is also extended significantly. And of course, precise adjustment of, of the background light is also easily possible. Additional cameras available on demand, so near-infrared cameras, in-gas in cameras, or ultraviolet and the size and shape sorting also on board here. Next slide. Typical defects color sorters can see, so everything discolored or moldy or even with fungi on, on the surface. Next slide. On the continuous treating system, we have a cross stream sifter in the inlet, thus improving the Heubach values, of course, or so removing all the dust before it will be chemically treated. It is self-emptying, therefore, again, important for the purity of the seeds. The primary treatment section has a spraying disc for liquids and a rotating dispersal cone for seeds, therefore doing excellent coverage without loss of, of liquids. And the secondary treatment section to really bring the, the, the treating agent from kernel to kernel is very gentle and, and takes care of the final coverage. Next slide. Dosing lines are with peristaltic pumps, so bringing high pressure on one side, no pulsing on the other side. And in addition, we have a mixing tank to really have a uniform mixing permanently of the liquids. The control unit has excellent process overview and is rather easy to adjust again. And of course, giving protocol alarms and all the automatics on board. Next slide. On the batch treater, we have electronic scale with big and fine flow system, so precise dosing of seeds and it is self-emptying. The slidable scale to have perfect access for cleaning and for maintenance and exchangeable wear liners, 
from stainless steel for long lifetime and, and easy changeability. Next slide. Batch treater works on the rotor starter principle, so we have an excellent mixing effect, precise and uniform coverage, and we save chemical or coating agents here due to the perfect spraying on the seats. Dosing lines and control units, same as on the continuous treater with all its advantages. Next slide. Typically treated seed. Next slide. Yeah, and finally, bagging and stitching. So as said before, we can easily change between a packing system for small bags and a big bag filling system on the other side within a few minutes. Next slide. Now finally, yeah, the central Hoover system, simple and quick housekeeping. So it was never as easy to keep the plant clean as here. And the PLC control with all the manuals on board, the spare part lists and automated service warnings. Next slide. And now finally taking a look at the installation. Next slide. First thing we do is we open the covers on the top of the bottom container and in the bottom of lower container. Then we put them on top of each other. Next slide. Install the catwalks and the stairs. And in the next step, we connect some piping with quick locks and also the electric plugs. Next slide. Then the belt conveyor and subsequently the intake pit. Next slide. Next one, please. Next slide. Yeah. And then in the last step, we install the cyclofan and the aspiration tube, and now the plant is ready to operate. Let me say we did that here within eight hours even. Next slide. Now, as stated before, plants we can offer is CSP5 for five tons an hour wheat, CMP2 for two to three tons an hour corn and also legumes, and the compact coffee plant CCP2. Next slide. So this is really a flexible solution for various products in grain, different seeds, coffee, and pulses. Next. So thanks for your attention. For whatever questions, feel free to contact Franz or me or your local Kimbria partner. And now we are open for the question and answer session. So we heard we extended the time a little bit. Thus, you see my contact, whatever questions you have, please send them to me and I will reply right away. So thanks for listening and have a good further Congress. Thank you. Welcome everyone. My name is Rose Sosa Richards and I am the ISF Seed Health Manager. And I'm here today to talk to you about emerging diseases and food security. In this session, together with a panel of representatives from the different sectors, seed industry, government and research, we will try to address current phytosanitary issues on seeds in the international arena. We will also address the impact of emergent pests and how emergent pests play a part on the current challenges facing the seed industry.
The international seed sector has one joint vision, a world where quality seed is accessible to all farmers to support sustainable agriculture and food security. This is shared by 70 national seed trade associations around the globe, representing over 7,500 seed companies, with its diversity of family companies, cooperatives, small, mid-size, and of course, multinationals. The adoption by different national plant protection organizations and PPOs of restricted phytosanitary regulation on seeds, including vegetable seeds, is observed to be increasing, perhaps as a direct result of an increase of emergent pests and disease. Seed is a globally traded agricultural product. Today, there is no country that could fully supply farmers with seed of their choice solely from their own production. This is very important to highlight. Seed companies produce and trial seed in different countries all over the world to mitigate the risk of crop failures due to several different reasons, including adverse weather conditions or pests. By finding optimal locations for seed production, timing of harvest and localized expertise, the seed sector ensured a steady supply of seed for farmers everywhere. We must meet the challenges of a changing world, tackling important issues such as emerging pests and restricted phytosanitary measures. When I mention pests, I'm also mentioning diseases. These issues can threaten the ability to meet a growing demand for food. Plant pests and disease appears to be proliferating at an ever-increasing rate. Scientific and popular media are full of terms such as new, emergent, re-emergent, and threatening, human, animal, but also plant diseases. Food security is threatened by an alarm increase in the number of outbreaks of transboundary pests and disease of plants and animals. These pests and disease jeopardize food security and have broad economic, social, and environmental impacts. So here to discuss about the challenge that the seed industry faces when moving seed internationally and how emerging pests plays part on the current challenges, it is my pleasure to welcome you all our panel for today. And here we'll have uh, joining us from Australia, we have Mr. Michael Leader. Michael is the chair of the ICEF Photocentric Committee and seed and he is also the seed regulatory lead for the Asian Pacific from Bayer. We also have with us today, Mr. Frank Klassen. He is the chair of the Seed Health Group Board and also vice president of operations for vegetable seeds in BSF. We also have with us Ms. Nico Horn, which is Director General of the European and Mediterranean Plant Protection Organization, and Professor Jean Ristanu. She is a William Neal Reynolds Distinguished Professor and Director of Emergent Plant Disease and Global Food Security Cluster at North Carolina State University, USA. Thank you everybody for being here today. It's very much appreciated. And without further ado, I would like to start by asking Perhaps you, Frank, first, from your perspective, what would you say is the impact of an emerging disease on food system, especially when you have BSF moving seeds, vegetable seeds across the whole world? What would you say from your side? Please, uh, your microphone uh, is muted. Frank, you, you're mute. I hope you can hear me now. Yes, I can. Yeah, thank you. Sorry for that. Um, yeah, thank you, Rose, for asking this question. The first thing that came in my mind when you were asking, uh, from my business point of view, how we look at uh, the, the, the global food systems, um, with all the global trade that we do nowadays in our vegetable seeds business, we of course see that um, that the impact of regulations that we have to deal with is not always uh, easy and complex to to um, to manage, and especially. We have some concerns if you see how this might impact the potential future food supply, uh, also for vegetables, if we see how, uh, yeah, how difficult it is nowadays to, uh, to 
to manage the regulatory requirements that we do face as a as an organization and we, we realize very well that we have for the society an important role to play in the future food supply so that's why we are looking forward also here to um, have a discussion today on the emerging diseases that are impacting highly our business every day Oh, that's great. Thank you so much, Frank. So I would like to pass now to, to Nico. Nico, the same question for you. What would you say, looking from Apple perspective, from the government perspective, what would be the impact of this emerging disease on food systems? Yeah, thank you, Ra Yeah, thank you, Rose, for um, asking this question. Um, perhaps first a few words on what EPO is. EPO is an intergovernmental organization actually supporting the national plant protection organizations in its member countries, 52 members, uh, Europe, North Africa and Central Asia. Uh, but it does not work on its own. Uh, it works with experts from countries and also I think it's very important we work together with industry because you know the situation best. But uh, when you ask this question in in this year of COVID, which is also an emerging disease, it's also that governments are blamed if they don't take action in time. So if something is emerging, it means that uh, the farmers or the citizens are expecting the governments to take action. And that's often action in uncertainty because you don't know yet how threatening this new pest is. And I think we have to keep that in mind that uh, governments are expected to act. Uh, and if they wait till they know enough, they may be too late. So I see this as a collaboration between industry and government, but uh, both have their own role. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nico. And uh, I think you said a very magic word and a word I will come back to it, which is collaboration. But now I would like to give the floor to Professor Jean Ristano, I think that you have been working so much in terms of plant disease, emergent plant disease, but also you have been writing books and written recent papers. What is your perspective that will be the impact of this emergent disease on food systems? Thank you, Rose. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. I lead a cluster of faculty at North Carolina State University that works on emerging plant disease and global food security. And we know that emerging pathogens impact not only food production, but they impact the access to food, the availability, the ability to utilize food resources and the stability of the food supply. So all the major components of food security are impacted by plant diseases and uh, seed systems are key to growing healthy plants. So I think uh, integration and collaboration with the seed sector is really key to, to controlling some of these emerging seed, seed borne transmitted pathogens. Yes. Thank you so much, Professor, this, this, this is really good. So I just would like to carry on on the same theme and then we have, uh, you guys have already given a, a little bit from your perspective. Michael, I would like to, to, to ask you, which kind of actions actually is the seed sector taking to be able to address this emerging disease? Thanks very much, Rose. And before I start, it's a pleasure to be on, on this panel today. Uh, it's great to have people not from the seed sector as well on here to be able to share ideas and to discuss these topics. Uh, just going on, I mean, we must remember that healthy seed is as important to the seed industry as it is to governments and to food security. It's vital for our customers, it's vital for our reputation, it's vital for, for, for business and food security. So that's one thing. So it's just as important to us and that's why I kept the word collaboration is, is something that I... I uh, I'm, I'm loving hearing on, on the panel today. You know, and we've got to hedge our bets in productions in different areas of the world as well. So uh, emerging, emerging pests do affect our ability to provide healthy seed as well. I think what, what we're finding though, and I think Frank did, did touch on this, is that unfortunately, we're finding that in response to these emerging diseases, you know, we're seeing an increasing adoption of restrictive regulation by, by governments across the globe, making it more difficult to get seed to growers when and where they need it. Um, what the Phytosanitary Committee at the ISF is doing is really trying to, to work with governments in implementing, you know, appropriate um, 
standards, I guess, and regulation and in accordance with some of the international standards to the International Plant Protection Convention and the IPPC. Uh, we know that ISP, ISP M38 was recently um, issued uh, and we find that some of these regulations are actually being implemented not in accordance with some of the, the requirements laid down in those standards in that, you know, sometimes that they're, they're actually, there's no flexibility in the options that are being required for, that are being allowed for, for, gov for companies and, and exporting governments to use. There's no transitional periods when some of these things are being implemented. When you know about the reality of, of seed production, that some of these seed has been produced one or two or three years beforehand, you know, that they're, they're implementing new testing regimes that are actually haven't been validated in exporting countries and where some of those exporting country governments don't have capacity. So we're trying to work at educating and, and bringing science-based um, decision making to trying to get them to appropriate to do appropriate risk assessments of seed as a pathway and trying to highlight their awareness of ISPM 38 as well to make sure that seed flows more easily. I think that's one of the major things that we're doing and, and I know we're collaborating very closely with the International Plant Protection Convention as well to try and make movement easier through the implementation of eFITOs and other aspects as well. And um, I, I might, I, I do have some one other thing, but I think that might be, um, we might be talking about transforming systems as well right now. And we've set up a, a brand new group under the phytosanitary committee as well um, to maybe look at alternative way on how we can actually deal with this. And wouldn't it be great if the seed management practices that companies are putting in place in their production systems to address emerging diseases and to address pathways of entry for disease are actually, um, I guess, accepted by governments as mitigating the risks that they want and that maybe we can implement a system where there isn't consignment by consignment testing and that when new emerging diseases do come about, hopefully that these systems can address the, the, the concerns of governments. So we're working on that as well. This is excellent, Mike, and thank you so much. Actually, you touch in quite a few topics that I would like yeah. to expand a little bit more going forward, especially the restrictive measures. We have the issues in terms of a lack of resource in some of the NPPOs, and of course, CIFS's approach, which is something of a great interest to the seed industry. But you, especially when you talked about restriction, I would like to come to Nico. Nico, what do you think about uh, which kinds of actions, actually? What is the government's doing right now? And of course, taking from what Mike already said, some of the issues that we have already come across, restrictive measures, lack of resource in some NPPOs, what would you say from your side? Thank you, Rose, for asking me this question. Uh, I mentioned already, and I heard it, uh, collaboration is one of the, the key words, I think. But before you can collaborate, you have to understand each other. Uh, and I think that's one of the things I, I notice sometimes in industry. They don't understand why governments are putting in unnecessary restrictive measures. But for me, it should not be the question, is it unnecessary? But it should be the question, MPPO, why do you ask these measures? Because they may have good reasons to protect themselves. So for me, mute, and, and the same is for MPPOs. MPPOs has to understand what industry does, what could be useful for the guarantee they are requesting. Michael mentioned the industry practices. But if you don't understand each other and the world that's behind uh, seed industry on the one side and the governments on the other side, I think it's difficult to find uh, a common ground and to work together and above all, create uh, trust in each other's work because I think that's essential. I think I'd like it's to leave that this at the moment. I think that the, yes, you said some key things, Nico. Dialogues, trust. This is are very important for collaboration. So I would like to to, to ask you, Professor, uh, from which kind of actions research is doing to address emerging disease? Because I know that there is a lot of technology out there, there out there. So what could you say that research is already working to be able to address emerging disease? Well. Um we uh, recently published a white paper in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences on Emerging Disease and Global Food Security. And uh, 
I think a, a convergent science needs to be done. And this needs to include all the stakeholders, not just academics, but industry, regulatory people working in, in this sector. Uh, I think a, a, a collaborative science that involves uh, uh, disease surveillance, that's key. Right now, when, when an outbreak occurs or pandemic occurs, regulatory agencies move to try to halt the epidemic or keep it from spreading. But we really need to be working in the action area pre-epidemic kind of detection and preventing spread from the outset. We tend to work uh, after the fact to try and put out the fire when the house is already burned down. And the idea is use disease surveillance and data mining activities or sensors, early detection technology, and geospatial analytics, earth observation data, uh, and then use that data to develop risk models and look at spread through certain pathways. Seed pathways were important means by which some seedborne pathogens or seed transmitted diseases move. So understanding what those risk pathways are. And also some countries do better than others in preventing disease in the first place. Even though the developed countries report more diseases, we don't necessarily have more outbreaks. We just have more scientists on the ground reporting and publishing on diseases. And so there's a lot of underreported disease. And um, so the idea is to uh, um, use a com combination of types of science, including population genomics. Uh, as the seed industry does detection technology and detects pathogens, sequencing genomes is key. If you look at the COVID-19 outbreak, we had uh, this next strain uh, website sequencing genomes of this virus. So now we know every time a new variant occurs anywhere and where it occurs, and then you can track it back to the source. Well, the same kind of things can be done with plant diseases. And um, we're, we haven't integrated the science fully, and uh, we are working with regulatory agencies, including in the U.S., APHIS, and, and uh, North American Plant, Plant Pe Protection Organization. But there needs to be more integration, more early surveillance so that we can uh, mitigate outbreaks before they spread. And then, then you have the tightening of regulation. So, you know, I'm, think, I'm thinking we need to backtrack to early detection and surveillance. Well, this, this is really interesting. So early detection, you believe this is something that we should be looking more. You mentioned a word, which is what I would like to bring now. You mentioned about conversion science, and it, this is, a, is, is a, a word that you use on your latest paper, the persistent threat of emerging plant disease pandemics to global food security. Can you just explain, I'm curious, can you explain a little bit more how the conversion science could be make a difference for the management of this emerging disease and how this could be serve as a, maybe an input for collaboration between governments, research, and also the private sector? Well, I look at, I look at emerging disease science as a convergent science. I mentioned uh, geospatial analytics. We have geographers working with us and people that, that look at, at uh, systems from a landscape level. You know, they, they use a different lens than maybe a plant pathologist might use where we're maybe detecting in seed or in plant material. And then the, uh, the geospatial analytics and, um, is very important in, in determining risk of spread. Uh, when you look at where pest outbreaks might occur uh, based on uh, reported occurrences and climate and weather data and trade networks, all those types of data scientists need to come together to do this convergent science. We have um, collaborations underway, not only with our chemical companies, but with you know, the National Science Foundation, the regulatory uh, scientists at APHIS, and then, um, and then you know, the risk analysis through uh, pest risk modeling. And these are all really important. And, I, and we need to be training our students to do this type of convergent science. Right now, we're working across four different colleges at the university, uh, and students are kind of training in these areas between colleges. We tend to train in our silos, and the convergence science really brings many dis different disciplines together to study a problem. So that will be a collaboration starting from science, not just a collaboration between the different types of science that they can be used for this, but also it could be expanded, I assume, the, including the, the power of the private sector and, of course, including with the governments. This is really Definitely. important. This is really important, Professor. I, I, 
and it's good to hear that there is already this uh, desire to collaborate across the different sectors. This is really good. I have. I would like to come back a little bit more into some of the, the, the topics that have already been brought up, especially from Michael and, and from Nico. So if we're talking about tomato infected virus, what a better example than the tomato brown rose fruit virus. Our major concern for the private sector. In a highly complex globalized food systems, differences in phytosanitary regulations pose a challenge to moving seeds across the world. The seed industry wants to fight an emerging disease. This is our interest, as what Michael and Frank has already mentioned. Seed health, plant health is important to us. But confusing new regulatory proposals, causing conflicting rules and causing problems for us. So how could a system-wide a, a system -wide approach could be helpful? And how could research be directed to face this challenge? I would like to start with you, Frank. So do you believe that the systems-wide approach would be helpful to tackling emerging diseases? Yeah, absolutely, Rose. Uh, if we looked at the poll, to say well, also what we just have heard, and I think also what Michael just explained, uh, the challenges that we do face as a seed industry, uh, I think uh, more harmonization would be absolutely welcome. Um, and systems approach could be something uh, in our way forward to, to establish that. I also want to repeat again that we have uh, a twofold responsibility, all of us. We want to deliver healthy seeds to our customers, and on the other hand, we also have to respect and will respect the national phytosanitary regulations. And what I would like to say in this regard is that also uh, we as, as um, seed industry under the umbrella of ISF, we, we are willing to work, of course, alongside with the MPPOs. And I think what Nico just said, it's about uh, mutual understanding uh, and, and gaining trust about what we do, because I think there is uh, some way to go to, to better understand uh, where the NPPO stand for, uh, why the EPO uh, takes the measures as they take them, and also the knowledge and the experience that we do have in the seed industry, how we can best uh, share that and, uh, and gain advantage out of that together. So ISF has been working already um, on promoting adoption of a systems approach, like you just uh, said uh, in your question, uh, what would come, what, what would be, let's say, a um, uh, systems approach related to the international movement of seeds. And in ISF, the goal would be that we uh, facilitate the international movement of seeds and that we, of course, support the development of a systems approach as an alternative option for the current phytosanitarian certification system. As Michael also said, today we have often a consignment by consignment uh, certification, uh, but the seed industry would be uh, likely to see this going into a direction where we go for a multilateral system approach. Um, in ISPM 38, we already have, uh, let's say, uh, recognized already these kind of, the, of approaches for system approach, and also especially when it comes to things like pest management and pest management practices that we already do apply in the seed companies, for example, in our seed production fields, uh, could, for example, be included in such a system approach. So I think we are very open to, uh, to this development. And we do believe that if we could use the best practices, uh, share all the knowledge that we do have available in the seed industry, together with governments, together with uh, with MPPOs, with uh, and also of course add academia to it to yeah, use make use of all the in industry information and knowledge that is there. Uh, we we think it would be good to consider all this and to to see how we can help develop uh, a system approach uh, for the movement of seeds internationally. Well said, Frank. Uh, Mike, would you like to add, uh, add something to what Frank just said? Oh, Frank did a pretty good job, it has to be said, but I, but I will say something, I think, just to add to that. Uh, I think, you know, we heard as well, we've got to resist the sudden, the sudden changes to existing regulatory frameworks. I think we heard that in the OECD today, that sudden changes can affect on these. And if COVID has taught us anything, it's that, you know, and these crises are going to become more, are going to become more and more often, presumably with climate change, with deforestation, with all of this is happening and, and human diseases, are, you know, this applies to plant diseases as well. So we really need to try and, uh, 
and find so, uh, something that's transformative if we're going to, you know, reach the sustainability goals and food security. I think even Peter Barker made that point as well yesterday. So this all ties in. And uh, and so what we are looking at, at uh, through the Fighter Sanitary Committee and through ISF is is to try and work with governments to implement a systems approach that would, would actually be different to a consignment, a consignment basis and would be based on on production practices and current production practices of the seed industry we believe that you know that's really maybe the the only way that we we really can move forward on this but we understand and as nico said the trust is really going to be the prime piece of doing this and how are we going to be able to help um Get help this, the governments understand what we do in these production systems. And this is going to be very, very important. And we are willing to be able to be participants in this and to share what we do. And I think the other piece of this is obviously is we need to be able to address and explain how we address their risks, their risks of concern. And, and so modelling and other aspects will be really important to that piece as well. Nice. Thank you so much, Michael. So, Nico, I think now is a, would be a perfect for you to say from your side, do you believe that the systems approach would be a way that we can uh, tackle emerging disease? Would that be something that the governments will be willing? I know that there is already work done from the IPPC level, but actually, once this is draft, once the annex will be drafted into ISPM 38 and start the implementation, do you believe that the NPPOs will be willing to receive this, to start to recognize the processes that the industry go through that is already a suitable alternative for the current consignment by consignment? Thank you, Rose, and thank you, Michael and Frank, uh, for your explanation. Very clear. Personally, I'm a strong advocate for system approaches because uh, that also has to do with my background. I worked for the MPP of the Netherlands, and I had then, as officer working at the MPP, already a close collaboration with seed industry. Uh, but in the discussions uh, uh, I had in our region, I see that there are two things I would like to uh, to raise and make uh, make you aware of. First of all, seed industry has a big advantage compared to MPPOs. You are already thinking and working globally. MPPOs don't work globally; they work nationally. Uh, so that means that two countries bordering each other could have different import requirements, because that's their own sovereignty to set that. For example, uh, one country asks 10,000 seeds, the other 50,000 seeds to be tested. That is the sovereignty to set their level of protection. Secondly, I would like to uh, warn, give a warning signal, and again, I'm not against it because I'm very much an advocate of the system, uh, is that uh, you mention, as a seed industry, system approach in one breath together with no consignment by consignment inspection and certification. For MPPOs, these are two completely separate things. You can have a system approach and a consignment by consignment certification. But then you certify that the, uh, the, the seeds have been produced in a system approach and still do your inspection. So uh, I think that to get it across to the MPPOs, you may have to do the discussion separately. So these are just two things I would like to note uh, in this respect from what I experienced in discussions with MPPOs on this subject. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nico. So what, when you say separately, what exactly are you trying to... to, to what would be the follow-up message for the separately in which way? Uh, I, I just got a little bit curious. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I can specify that. Uh, a system approach um, is a way to give a guarantee. Certification is then a way how you express that guarantee and can be sure that um, the inspector who does that can be sure that when he issues a certificate, it fulfills the requirements. And I think we have to separate these two in the sense that have a discussion how a system approach can give the guarantee uh, but uh, have a separate discussion on uh, what that means for certification. Certification is actually the core, one of the core work tasks of an MPPO. So for some MPPOs, I noticed that you 
touch on their core task if you take that away. Thank you. Thank you, Nico. So, uh, uh, Professor Ristanio, so you can see that there is a lot of uh, discussions in terms of systems approach, recognition mm -hmm. of the current processes and procedures that the seed sector has already put in place. From the research side, how can the research help this going forward? Which other tools has already been used or that you are aware that they could be used by the seed sector that we don't know, or perhaps that even support the seed sector even more to be able to adopt uh, for the systems approach? So uh, this is the discussion is very interesting because uh, I could see the two approaches, you know, the systems approach and consignment testing being integrated somehow. Um, uh, you know, early detection, I mentioned early detection can help prevent an uh, epidemic from spreading. And that would be true in seed systems as well. So uh, integration of, of new technologies. We're working in, in our lab and at the university uh, with sensors for disease detection. Right now in the seed system testing, cedar, a lot of uh, aliquots are tested, their microbes are grown out on culture or they do PCR and ELISA tests. And then, or even inoculations to see if a virulent pathogen is in seed. All of this takes days to weeks. And um, with uh, say and seed production system actually integrating sensor technology early on um, in fields to determine if a given pathogen is even present in the area, because you could exclude areas for further downstream testing if you if if you know a pathogen isn't present. That could be at a field level or at a country level. Uh, and using sensors, we, we've developed some volatile organic compound sensors and microneedle patch sensors, uh, very quick methods for uh, detecting the presence of particular pathogens, because some are more regulatory concern than others. If something's not transmitted by seed, it may, it may not be important to be testing it. You have your list of top pathogens that are of concern. So, you know, integrating some new technologies into the, into the, production systems early on so that and that would help uh, with the phytosanitary certificates later on down the line if you know you've gone through several steps and you certified the pathogen isn't present in the field and you've sampled seed there's no seed born problem or seed transmitted problem you know you can kind of check off the boxes so I could kind of see integration of the two um, I'm not particularly familiar with all the different regulations country by country, but in terms of how the, the, the technology could be integrated into production systems, I think there's opportunities for new work. And uh, it would, uh, and it would also help some of the small, smaller developing countries that don't have access to technology. You know, you mentioned about the big, uh, you know, ag chemical companies, big seed companies that uh, have a global reach. They have boots on the ground everywhere in many countries and can do early uh, reporting or detection, uh, techn use technologies that could help in preventing spread, uh, you know, and, and they could work in collaboration with some of the smaller countries who don't have those sorts of uh, technologies at their fingertips. Thank you so much. This is really, really good. And, and, and I can see that the systems approach hopefully will be something that will together with science that we can bring all the different sectors together and then we collaborate even more. I would like to ask a question, Nico, directly to you. We have been talking about systems approach. There is already under IPPC the development of uh, an annex for the SPM 38. So how do you believe that the international standards, especially the ones that are, is already out there drafted by the International Plant Protection Convention, how do you think they can help to address the emerging disease? Yeah, the, 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 there is, of course, for me, uh, a difference. Um, what is an emerging pest? If you know the pest, then you know um, what you can do. But sometimes emerging pests are pests that you don't even know they're around yet. And we had that with COVID-19, of course. We didn't know it was around. And you can't say if we had tested more, we had uh, avoided this pandemic, which you didn't know what to test for. And I, I very much see uh, Sean Ristano uh, that science can be a, full of, a lot of a help. So I think the system approach should um, give, say, a kind of guarantee of production, not pest by pest. Because if you do pest by pest, you should know which pests are. 
So it should be more a kind of system that gives a level of guarantee against, I would almost say, any pest, also those that you don't know yet. Uh, and you can't test for the ones that you don't know. So I think, um, and I come back to what I said before, it is actually uh, discussing and explaining to MPPOs that a system approach does give a high level of guarantee if it's uh, uh, applied properly. And then it comes, comes again back to trust. And how do we trust? But we have examples in uh, other um, areas, and many of you may be aware of uh, the wood packaging material and the requirement for an IPPC mark on it. These marks are all applied by industry, and they're only audited. Uh, so I think, uh, and that took a lot of time to develop that. But I think the system approach for seeds uh, could follow a similar road, but don't expect it to be in place in two or three years. It takes time. Thank yeah, you. Well said, Nico. Uh, so, Frank, can you, uh, from, the, from the seed sector side, do you believe that the international standards will, will help address this, including the new annex that is being drafted for the SPM 38? Yes, absolutely. Um, and what we have to realize also is that, yeah, like Nico just said, is this something that will probably not be achieved in, um, in two or three years? It's, and we, we know that very well. This is a complex uh, subject. Um, what I would like to emphasize also on in this case is that we have to realize that, um, that when we talk about the phytosanitary measures, it's partially related, of course, to um, the things we just talked about. Uh, how can you manage your production systems in a safe way and systems approach that you start with healthy seeds and that you finally also harvest healthy seed. But even in the process, uh, like we are experiencing today, uh, we also see often that uh, additional declarations are asked for, for example, for seed health testing. And also there we see that, um, that the, the, the trend is that um, NPPOs uh, take, let's say, the route of uh, easy, fast, uh, relatively inexpensive testing that they use, where there's, of course, logic, and also we want to go for sensitive tests uh, and preferably what we can do easy, uh, easily execute. But on the other hand, we also should question what, what do we actually test for? So also there is a discussion about um, what is the, the context where we are looking in? Is, is it uh, is, is the pathogen or the emerging disease that we're talking about, uh, is it really um, something that that is having biological relevance if we find a spot, uh, for example, on a seed lot. So I think when we talk about uh, systems approach, when we talk about uh, ISPM 38, and we talk about all the regulations, how we want to put this all together in the nearby future, uh, we have to look from different angles. It's, of course, the, the practicalities that we use from the best practices from the industry. Uh, on the other hand, we also need to understand the epidemiology of the, of the disease and, and also see what, from a research point of view, like also just addressed, uh, we can do more uh, together to finally uh, base our uh, decisions uh, and also our regulations based on yeah, true uh, facts and figures based on the good scientific uh, background and rationale. Because that's what we believe uh, is also a challenge today in the current system, and if we talk about systems approach in the nearby future, this is also something that we would like to see addressed in a way that we at least secure that when we block seed lots to bring it to the global seed movement, uh, that we do it for the right reasons and that we really have, let's say, uh, best risks instead of that we block seed lots that theoretically do not have uh, really a problem. Thank you. Thank you so much, Frank. So, Michael, uh Carry on on the same theme. Do you believe that the private sector should have a, a what whole role the private sector should have in the development of international standards? Look, thanks, Rose. I, I really think that the we, we, Nico already gave an example of how how we can help in the development of standards, and ISBM 38 is a perfect example as well, where you know we can provide the technical expertise you know, and the educational avenue that, that some of the NPPOs need um, to, to understand and, and create standards around specific issues such as the movement of seed or, or providing stamps onto particular aspects there of consignments. And 
I think it's not just about the development piece, but it's also about the implementation as well. We should be part of a partnership on this piece. And when you have standards that says, you know, the role of the industry could be to do this, and we should also bring that to the table and be prepared to be part of a, a, a you know, part of the partnership and to work together on these things, whether it's about monitoring, whether it's about reporting or, or working together to work out exactly what might be required. And we need to think it differently, as Nico said, NPPOs are coming with a different concept than we are, and we need to address their concerns. And how can we do that um, and explain how we are meeting their concerns? So we have to think differently as well going forward, Rose. No, that's great. Thank you so much for that. Do we have some questions from, uh, from the, the audience? So I would like to address this. Uh, uh, perhaps, Michael, you can uh, answer this, uh, the first part of the question. Uh, someone, uh, Philippe Lisanne from France, he's asking, what could the industry do better to outreach on systems approach for seeds at the level of the NPPOs? Michael, what do you say about that? Yeah, thanks, Philippe, first. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we can definitely do better, and, and COVID hasn't hasn't helped, but, but we need to actually get out there and show them what we do. We need to show our practices. We need to, we need to help build trust in what we do, and I think we are starting that and having some conversations about doing some pilot studies right now um, to actually bring in PPOs to our to our production sites and actually understanding what, what we're doing. I, I think we need to, to communicate more, as I said before, in the way that they're thinking, not the way we're thinking, because in the end, it's the MPPOs are going to discuss and agree on whether this could be something that, that they could use as part of their certification process. So I think um, we need to do that to do that better and, and, and partner more, I think. I know that's an easy way out, but it, but it, it sounds, you know, everybody can say that, but it is something that we really need to do, I believe. I'm not sure it would be an easy way, Michael, but... No, it's, uh... <laughs> it's, not, it's not, but but communicating and making sure that we're transparent and coming up with what we're actually doing, and, and, and I, I think will go a long way um, to, to, to helping to build that trust with them on that piece and being part of the process in the expert working group, um, you know, working on this at the IPPC level will be will be a great step forward as well. And we need to come there with, with you know, willing to listen to what they, they want to see as the system comes forward. Okay, now well said. So, Nick, with the second half of the question, I think it should be for you. So, could Apple support the industry to become more efficient with its actions toward NPPOs? What do you say? Uh, good question, uh, Rose. Um, I've noticed that especially in the Apple region, there is quite a diversity of approaches on system approaches, and there are some countries that are much more willing to accept it than others. So I, I, I very much like the idea that industry has pilots. Michael mentioned it already, pilots for some countries, because there are countries that are more willing. So I have my doubts about whether Apple can uh, convince those countries that are not willing at the moment. Uh, what we can be do, we can, we can and we certainly will have discussions with our member countries on a new standard coming up. But I noticed in the first discussion we had uh, a few years ago before this proposal came that there was not full support in the Apple region. And that's because of the difference of the different countries. So, uh, as I said already, personally, I'm in favor of this, uh, this developments. We should also realize that MPPOs have limited resources. And as Michael said, you have the standard development and you have the implementation. And I think in the implementation, you're doing a great job with starting some pilot with willing countries, and that will set the example. Uh, so, yes, promoting it in the Apple region, but I can't convince countries if they're, uh, they're hesitant or against the proposal. Thank you. Yes, I think that convincing and trying to sell that is going to be the hard part with the implementation of this annex, and, and because this will need to be done at the national level. There is one question that it was already uh, here in the chat, and it was since from the, from the previous session. I think I will address this to you, Frank. It is a quite long question, so just bear with me. On seed movements, we have seen delays on into COVID restrictions and also lesser flights. However, we have seen major delays also because of regulatory changes, especially with disease testing part, where key vegetable producing countries were not prepared as required. How we can make sure we have less impact and also look at options like tests at the destinations if the countries lack facilities or expertise? How can we influence the regulators? 
You're mute, Frank, I believe. Thanks for this question, Rose. Uh, and I think it's uh, it's a long question indeed, but it's also really a question uh, that is very, very important. And I think especially when we talk today about food systems for the future, what we have to realize is that we that we deal more and more with complexity when it comes to this testing. And, and yes, we, we do have uh, had difficulties with COVID uh, in, in shipments, but that was, I think, relatively limited if you compare the challenges we currently have today with some um, pests uh, related to some crops uh, where, where we have also requirements now uh, by NPPOs where we have to go for specific tests. Well, in the early days, you saw that there was no test available. Um, I think we as ISF, as a seed health group, we could add uh, with the expertise and the knowledge we have gained over the years, we could come to a pretty fast uh, test uh, option. Uh, that helped uh, when, when we saw at least uh, the seed moving again. But on the other hand, you also saw in the industry, sorry, in the um, in the different countries, you saw that NPPOs take a different way of how they apply the rules. And that is, of course, then when seed companies come into difficult situations where you see that uh, one country is having different requirements than the other. And especially when it comes to a seed health test that has been added to this, uh, it is really then, yeah, let's say, affecting anyhow the lead times. Uh, if you talk about global movement of seeds, uh, you have to have a lab that is qualified and, and validated for executing uh, the test as it was prescribed by some of the MPPOs. Uh, and that's that's taken quite some burden for, for our seed trade today. Uh, and that's something also where we really have to see how we can manage this in the future. Uh, it comes back, I think, to what we just have heard earlier today. It's about, I think, collaboration, uh, talking to the MPPOs and sitting together with the governments to to explain uh, what the impact is on, on the food systems and the foods, uh, let's say, in the seed supply, not only today, but especially in the nearby future. Because like I addressed before, um, the question is, what are you testing for? What is the context? Is is the, the pathogen you are, uh, let's say, want to detect, is that indeed viable and is it indeed pathogenic of the seed present or not? Uh, these are, in our opinion, very crucial uh, questions. Uh, but we see today that there is more and more the tendency that MPPOs want to go for, for risk avoidance. And, and we do understand that. Uh, but on the other hand, we also would like to the MPPOs to understand what the implications are, not just for trade, but also for uh, the future food supply. Because if this would lead to blocking seed inventories, which we can not ship across the world, that do not have a risk at all, then that really would have a supply issue uh, or a food issue in the nearby future. And, and what we will do, and what I think we should do, and that was the question is, yeah, sit together uh, with the, the relevant stakeholders, explain uh, what we know, uh, share the knowledge, share the experiences and the challenges, and try to come to consensus to see how we can mitigate in the nearby future uh, in these kind of challenges. But uh, not an easy task, but we should continue to open a dialogue. And it's also good to hear today from Nico that yeah, he's also promoting assistance approaches, also promoting the collaboration and working on our trust levels. I think that's really the way forward to, uh, to come to solutions in the nearby future. No, oh, absolutely. Well said. And this has been an incredibly panel, an incredible discussion today. I'm starting to be worried we're getting short of time, and I, I wish I could speak with you guys longer, another hour perhaps, or, or another full day. I think there is so much we could talk about. But for the last question, I would like to go to all of you. And I would like you to guys to tell me, what is your top three actions? As a seed sector, as government, as research, that you, you should take in plant health to minimize the impact of emerging diseases. So, Professor, I would like you to start. So from the research side, what would be the top three actions? Um, well, for, through the discussion today, we've, uh, I was thinking of this before the panel, but, you know, interagency and interstakeholder collaboration. You know, there needs to be transparency and trust amongst the players. And uh, this is, I think this could go a long way in, in helping mitigate emerging pest outbreaks. Also, um, you know, from the research side in terms of developing new mitigation strategies, we didn't really get talk about this, but you know, if, if mitigation strategies are deployed in a timely manner, you can prevent seed transmission of diseases. 
Uh, so really getting the mitigation strategies out quickly to prevent outbreak spread, and then also reaching the kind of smaller countries that lack infrastructure. You know, there, there are many uh, areas in the world where there is, an is not an extension service like we have in the U.S. with the uh, extension people out on the ground uh, surveying fields and, and doing uh, work to look for pathogens. And, you know, so kind of impro improving capacity development in the smallholder countries, uh, interagency collaboration. And I think, you know, uh, really uh, building that infrastructure will help reduce outbreaks and spread. Thank you. Nicole? Perhaps a bit, uh, sorry, thank you for um, asking this question, Rose, and I may seem a bit repetitive, but number one is uh, for me collaboration, but collaboration between industry, research, and governments. So the uh, MPPOs, uh, uh, industry, and research. I think the three of them are very important. Uh, what action is, I think, also important to understand each other. Uh, MPPOs should be try to get in the position of seed industry. Why do you want things? And I hear you talking about glo global uh, food security, but an MPPO agency is in the government, and it may sound fragmented, is not responsible for food security. So maybe you have to talk at a higher level at the ministry. Uh, so, uh, but also, I think, and therefore, the industry should get into the position of the MPPO and understand why you ask different things. And I, th I believe that in transparency and understanding each other is the first step to get uh, progress and collaboration. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nico. Michael. Look, thank, thanks a lot, Rose, and, and uh, appreciate being part of the panel today. There's, yeah, you're right. There's so much more that we could be saying on this. <laughs> I, I think on the on the three things, I think the first thing is that seed industry can do is really, I guess, partner with and educate governments about actually implementing ISPM 38 fully right now. I mean, we, we know that there are about 75% of regulated pests on seed. Seed is not even a pathway. We need to be helping to partner with them to finish those pest risk analyses on seed and to reduce where seed is not a pathway and also look at um, where, where the end use is not seed for sowing to remove those regulations as well to help new germplasm to help seed move, I, I think, and reduce the costs of seed movement and understand the reality of that. Um, that also applies to ISPM 45 about trying to get more resources devoted to monitoring stuff as opposed to doing certification for export. So I think implementation education on, on, on ISPM 38, but I think we should partner with NPPOs, listen to them and build trust to help transform, you know, and make it more resilient, but transform the system for moving seed and, and try to implement as an alternative this systems approach we were talking about. And that, that means opening up and letting NPPOs see what we do um, and listening to their concerns and thinking how they would in the opposite way to what Nico was saying. Uh, and I think the third, we didn't even touch on this really, but is investing in technologies, you know, whether it's monitoring technologies, which I'd love to listen more about <laughs> on that <laughs> professor at some stage, but, but whether it's, it's it's gene editing, it's other technologies that we can use to address these emerging diseases as well. There still is reluctance to implement technologies in plant health, whereas in the terms of human health and, co and this COVID situation, they're willing to do it straight away. And so how we, how, you know, we need to still be investing in those areas in plant health as well. So they're the three, the three points I would make, Rose. No, that's absolutely fine. And yes, we, sh we could have talked so much more about monitoring, <laughs> surveillance, and all the technology that Professor Jean Ristan has been developing. And perhaps this is what we're going to do. We will have another panel with where she'll be able to talk all about the research that she's doing, which is fascinating. But Frank, I would like to give you the last 30 seconds to you. Please tell me what will be your first, your top three actions? Yeah, thank you, Rose. Uh, well, the first one was uh, actually a hybrid between Michael's and Nico's remark. Uh, I also truly believe that uh, collaboration between uh, 
<clears throat> policymakers, governments, researchers in the private sector is key, uh, and especially also share the information and the knowledge we do have, like Michael explained um, in ISPM 38, but also in, the, for example, the PESLIC list activities. Uh, second, I would say, yeah, the harmonization is really something where I think we are already working on together, but I really would hope we can uh, give it a, a stronger boost. Um, no, it's not easy, it's complex, but I think this is really the way forward. And I'm happy to hear also that Nico is supportive to this uh, idea. And let's see how we can collaborate together in shaping this uh, for the future. And last but not least, uh, that will be my third point, is, uh, is also coming back to research. Um, I think it's important to, to focus more on the scientific evidence and rationale behind our seed testing protocols. Uh, it's key because if we would continue with what we do today, I truly believe it has uh, serious concerns uh, in the nearby future with regards to the availability of seed, uh, which also affects indirectly the food supply. And that I think is also something where we should not underestimate and more research is needed to understand what we do and that we also can uh, learn from each other and convince also uh, the regulators what is the best way forward in our phytosanitary regulations? Thank you so much. Thank you so much for all the speakers. I think it was a very productive and very healthy dialogue. I think that we have touched on very important uh, issues that it is for the seed sector, it is for governments, but it is also for research. I really appreciate all of you to have come and join me today. I appreciate all the, the, the audience to have come and join us here. And thank you so much. And I'll leave with the message that the Dialogue, trust, collaborations are very important for us to, eat, to address the current issues, especially emerging disease. And with that, I would like to close the panel today. Thank you all so much, and looking forward to see you all on the next opportunity. Thank you. Silmar Teicher Pesky, editor of Seed News magazine from Brazil. On today, we're going to have a panel on the business outlook of the seed sector in Brazil. But first, let's talk a little bit about Seed News magazine. It was created in 1997 and is published in Portuguese, Spanish, and English with technological articles, essays, and news, and has collaboration from many professionals. On the screen, you are seeing the first edition that was on plant breeding on its relationship with agriculture. We also have many other editions, but the last one in May 2021 was an interview with Michael Keller from ISF that uh, talked about international trade and other aspects. About the panel, it will consist of parts. The first one will be by Abrazain, that stands for Brazilian Seed and Seedling Association, that Paulo Campante will tell us how the seed system is. 
After that, we're gonna have Andreas Schenning that will talk about the soybean seed business on the players on the market. Also, we're gonna have a, a talk on the forage seeds that will be covered by Marco Roversi. And the last one will be on vegetable seeds that will be done by Marcelo Pacotti. Hello, everyone. I hope this video can find you, your family well and safe. My name is Paulo Campante. I'm a director in CropLife Brazil, and we represent the breeding sector here in Brazil. But today I would like to talk about Abrazen, the Brazilian Seed Association. I don't know why they asked me to talk about Abrazen. Maybe it's because I've been working Abrazen during the last 15 years, so um, probably know a little bit about Abrazen and how Abrazen works and how important is the role in Abrazen in the seed industry here in Brazil. Abrazen is the Brazilian Seed Association and Abrazen represents more than 14 different associations in Brazil and more than 400 companies here in Brazil that are doing business in different kinds of crops. Since row crops as soybean, corn, cotton, wheat, rice, beans, and also in vegetable seeds sector in tropical forage also. Abrazen has almost 50 years working with the four main areas in Brazil. Regulatory, intellectual property, education and communication, and help companies bring new technologies to the farmers. So during the last years, Abrazen has been working really hard uh, to build this kind of uh, relationship, uh, some kind of bridge between the government and the private sector in order to guarantee the best environment as possible to companies making business in Brazil. And, uh, and I, when I say that, I say uh, uh, environmental that can be predictable, transparent and stable. I would like to give you uh, some examples how Abrazen works and how this kind of works the Abrazen doing with the government can produce uh, a best environment to, to the, the companies making business in Brazil. In 2018, Abrazen and other associations works really close to the government to publish uh, a new NPT law in Brazil. This gen editing uh, legislation now allows companies, universities, institutes uh, establish some kind of work doing uh, research and bringing new products to the market using gen editing in Brazil. In 2018, Abrazen and the Minister of Agriculture was together to review the, the most important uh, legislation in the seed area here in Brazil. Um, during the whole year, Abrazen and the Minister of Agriculture develop, review each article of this law. In 2020, the new legislation of the seed law was published here in Brazil. As you may know, agriculture is one of the most important sectors here in Brazil. And I'm pretty sure then seeds play a, a crucial role to keep this system running. Um, seeds give to the farmers the best tools and the best technology to keep the numbers high and growing year by year. So for that, it's, it's really important to have some kind of uh, strong association to, to play the important role and build bridges between government and private sector in order to keep this system available, stable, transparent and predictable. Thanks, Paulo, with the overview of the role of Abrazen in the seed business in Brazil. Now comes André Schenning with the soybean seed sector. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is André Schenning. Uh, today, I am the vice president of Abras, the association of seed, soy seeds producers from Brazil. And first of all, it's a pleasure for me to be here with you and have the opportunity to share uh, some things about 
our market and our our job in in the association. Okay, I will share uh, for you uh, some slides to show uh, about uh, soy soy seeds uh, markets and our association. Okay, Abras is the Brazilian Association of Soy Seeds Producers. Today we have uh, 47 members in the most part of Brazil, all the, the states, and we have a, a, a big share uh, of the market uh, working with us uh, in the soy seeds issues uh, in the Brazil. Okay, uh, in this graphic we, we can see the, the production of soy seeds, uh, just uh, the production the, the production from the Abras members. Uh, in 2020 we produce uh, 13 million of bags uh, of uh, soy seeds and uh, we we are looking to produce uh, around 15 million uh, of bags in 2021. Uh, speaking a little bit about the uh, certificate semi, uh, seeds uh, utilization, today we have 65, 67% of the, the our seeds uh, uh, of the seeds are using with the growers is certificate seeds. Uh, the total of production of seed certifications seeds in Brazil is uh, 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 three point point eight million of bags, and uh, the the growth area, uh, the cultivate area uh, of, of, of soybeans is uh, 30, around 37 million of acres. This is from Abrazen and uh, we, we are talking about uh, the year of the, the year, uh, about uh, the year of 2019. Okay, and uh, now we are we are showing you uh, the soy seeds market, uh, talking about uh, genetic breeders. This is the players of the market today: GDM Grupo do Mario, with uh, three three uh, uh, companies with with seeds uh, that work with seeds, uh, two breeds, and. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, two labels, okay, and Bio with two labels too, Singenta with two labels, Corteva three labels, and Bass two labels, and, and then uh, TMG, Tropical, Melhoramento Genética, uh, Seedcorp HO, FT, Sementes, e Embrapa, the Embrapa, the, the govern, government uh, uh, company, uh, and uh, there is others uh, small players in the market, but this is the, the, the most part of the, the, the big players in the genetic breeders in Brazil. Uh, our big challenge today is uh, to deal about quality. We are trying to improve year per year uh, our quality, uh, looking for the market target uh, not the legal determination because the the growers want to to have uh, and to pay for that uh, high quality with seeds to use in in, in their crops uh, and the legal determination is uh, plus more uh, eighty percent of germination and we are trying to deliver seeds with uh, more than 90% uh, of germination. 
And the, the most uh, focus today is to, to use the, the force, vigor in Portuguese, uh, to, to sell our seeds, to select it, to, to deliver it for, for the, the growers. And we are trying. There is no legal determination about force of seeds, but we are trying to, to get the target to, to deliver for, for our customers a very high force uh, for the seeds. Okay, uh, that's uh, uh, the our uh, that's our presentation. We we want to to uh, congratulate uh, the event, and we are always open to to talk about soybeans market, seeds market, and our our business for all. Okay, thank you very much. It's a pleasure for me. Uh, have a good time. From the presentation, I would like to point out that Brazil cultivates more than 37 million hectares with soybean, from which 65% is with certified seeds, having a seed market over $1.6 billion a year. About the yield, we have a yield of 3.6 tons per hectare that is the highest in the Americas. And this is due to the farmer that adopts innovation, the plant breeder that is putting good varieties in the market, and the seed producers that is selling high quality seeds. About the quality of the seed, for many years, the seed producer was putting in the market seed lot with minimum 80% germination. And right now, more than 50% of the seed producers are putting in the market soybean seed lots with the minimum of 90% germination and vigor evaluated. Also, I would like to stress that the Brazilian farmers are recognizing the work of the plant breeders by paying royalty or the technological fee. Hi, nice to be here with you, out there remotely. I'm Marcos Rovelli, I'm executive manager of the Unipasto, Association for the Promotion of Research in Tropical Forage Improvement. I'd like to talk to you about some important points of the tropical forage seeds business. The importance of Brazil for the production and supply of quality beef in the world is undeniable. The Brazilian livestock gained new markets and attained the position of world's largest beef exporter since 2003. Thanks to technological advance and reduction in production costs under sustainable system of cattle rises, primarily on improved pastures. Brazilian climatic conditions provide competitive advantages for the use of pastures as feed. Therefore, the continuous generation of improved forage cultivars is essential to meet the demand for productive forests of better nutrition value in the various production systems in the different Brazilian ecosystem. Besides being a great producer and exporter of beef, Brazil is the main producer and exporter of tropical forest seeds in Latin America. The demands for quality and quantity of seeds have driven in the entire livestock production chain to the point of promoting the organization to the seed sector. The seed sector of tropical forest peas has been expanding its production areas over the years and introducing new practices and technologies to increase the productivity and also new cultivars and hybrids of height added value are being offered to the market but it's still not very expensive given the abyss that exists between launch and adoption 
by the farmer. We can mention that in the last five years, the areas of seed production of the main forage species grew 70%, reaching in the last survey an area near to 200,000 hectares. The production obtained grew 80%, going from 35 to 60,000 tons of pure seeds. The cultivars that deserve mention are still Brachiaria brisanta marandu and Panico Máximo Mombasa, both introduced by Embrapa in the 80s. These cultivars represent until now close to 51% of the seed supply on the market. The sector has been showing an alternation of good and bad results directly influenced by the instability of production costs by recurrent climatic adversities in the regional seed production hubs, as well as the prices of inputs at aroba in agricultural commodities. On average, the sector has annual revenues near to $300,000 being 20% coming from the exportation, mainly to Latin American countries. Another important issue that continues incessantly within the national seed sector and ministries in this discussion on the new cultivar protection laws. With this, it is expected to efficiently combat seed piracy, a growing situation. Currently, the Cement Legal project that was developed in partnership with Septis Agro to mitigate the use of illegal seeds. In this case, the cultivar is recognized by the market through a label that it has the function of authenticating and tracking the seeds. Thank you so much. Very well. From Marcos Raver's presentation, I would like to point out that Unipasto is a partnership between forage seed producers and a plant breeding program. And also that Unipasto is in the process to release hybrid materials be besides the conventional varieties. Hello, everyone. First of all, on behalf of Brazilian Seeds and Seedling Seed Association, ABCZEM, I would like to express our pleasure to attend the ASF Virtual Forage 2021. We congratulate the organization team of this important event for the seed business, and especially the Secretary General of the ASF, Ms. Marco Keller, as well as the panel coordinator, Dr. Shamar Pesky, for the invitation, and our colleagues of Abrazin, of which we are members, represented by the executive president, Mr. José May. My name is Marcelo Pacuach, and I'm the executive director of ABCZ. ABCZ was founded in 1970, and we operate in the vegetable and flower seed and seedling businesses. We currently have 40 associated companies, among them Brazilian and multinational companies. Over 98% of the vegetable seed companies operating in Brazil are ABCZ associated. This year, the global seed sector celebrates the International Year of Fruits and Vegetables. Among several activities, ABCZ has consistently promoted the consumption of vegetables and fruits by highlighting the importance of those products in the health diet, well-being, and longevity. In addition, we must emphasize the nutritional quality and increased immunity offered by this food, especially today. As a part of this work since 2018, 
we have developed the Nurture Plus Salad Company, which aims to inform the benefits of a health diet and educate Brazilian people to increase fruits and vegetable daily consumption. To allow the consistent supply over the year with quality and fair prices, we strongly believe in the importance of innovation through research and development programs and the movement of the seeds around the world. To fulfill this noble mission of feeding the world, the seed movement is decisive. According to the United Nations forecast, the world's population will reach 9.7 billion by 2050. Thinking about meeting this demand, the industry will need to achieve ever higher levels of efficiency with a balanced regulatory global environment, which always preserves plant health safety, and that includes all the logistic components inherent to the processing, treatment, improvement, quality control, and a packing of seeds, which are commercialized and distributed globally. Finally, we understand that good communication is the main tool to build the everyday a secure, efficient, and balanced global seed distribution system, where ISF is the key to the success of this process. We wish you all an excellent Congress and thank you very much. Thanks, Marcelo, for the presentation. Vegetables are really very important for nutrition. We would like to thank ISF for the opportunity to talk about seed news and to coordinate the panel of the business outlook of the Brazilian seed sector. Bye bye. Hello everyone and welcome to Syngenta Seed Care. We are very happy to welcome today our seed care leaders. We have uh, Jonathan Donkey Brown, who is our head of uh, seed care, Crystal Burgmeister, who is the head of Seed Care Institute, and Pale Pedersen, uh, head of product management. We thank you, uh, our customers, for placing our trust in us as your partner along the journey to maximize the potential of the seed. Today, we are really happy to talk to you about some exciting new technology that we have in store for you. My name is Andrea Popa, and I am Global Key Account Lead uh, for Seed Care. Before I hand over to Jonti uh, for um, introductory remarks, let's take a look at a short video that shows uh, our last 10 years of history together.
John D, over to you. Right, thanks very much, Andrea. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to be here, first of all. Um, it's my first time at ISF. I'm John T. Brown. I'm the global head of Seedcare. I've been in the role about six months, which is why I need to be surrounded by really capable people from the team here, and they can answer all the tough questions. And, and look, it gives me uh, the, the double pleasure of being here, uh, sadly not in physical presence with you all, just on the basis that um, the COVID continues. I pulled up this slide behind as the welcome slide deliberately because it's all about Syngenta with you guys, our customers, and in this case, the field, in the field with customers, training and educating them. Hopefully the times will come where we can get back to normality as soon as we can, and I can meet with you and the team can meet with you in, in physical presence again. But Syngenta's mantra in this period of the last 18 months has been very much focused on safety. Safety of our team, safety of our customers, safety of our clients and, and farmers right around the world. We play a unique part in, in delivering food and sustainable food production for the world, and safety continues to be the mantra in, under the COVID times. My other reflection is on the video. The video was a 10-year frame of where we've come from since we had seed care. Now, Syngenta's history in seed treatments is much longer than that. We've actually been in seed treatments for around about 40 years, formerly as ICI and then AstraZeneca, and from the Ciba Geige and the Sandoz times to Novartis, and in the merger of 2000 with Syngenta. In 2010-11, we came with the seed care logo. We came with the P, the A, and the S strategy to support you, our customers, and that's what we continue to frame ourselves around. We believe we have the depth and breadth of a portfolio like no other company in enabling you and your farmers to maximize yield and potential. We have the multiplicative effect with the application, the A, making sure we're able to train and educate you on the technologies and work with you on new and novel technologies that treat the seed. And then in terms of services, supporting training, education and learning around the Seed Care Institute piece. Luckily, Pally will talk about the portfolio. Krista will talk about the service side. What we want to do first, though, is specifically talk about the technologies. That breadth of technology that Pally will refer to, he'll talk about Timerium. It's our new innovation in the seed care space. He'll also talk us through the biological space and what we're doing in biologicals. And latterly, he'll talk about one of our unsung heroes, the Vibrance Anniversary. Likewise, Crystal will then talk us through how we do the application and service support through the Seed Care Institutes. So that's what we're going to do. Looking forward to having the questions and answers at the end and, and look back to you, uh, Andrea. Thank you, John T. So let's uh, dive straight into it. Uh, I keep hearing Timerium everywhere on the corridors in Syngenta <laughs> and also outside. So tell us a bit more about uh, this new technology that we're bringing to the market. Well, isn't that exciting? Everybody talks about it, you know. I'm really excited, you know, we're really excited about it. So Timerium technology is a new active, uh, new solution, new product offers that will come from Syngenta Seed Care that uh, we are working on. This was a product that was discovered in a very specific research project looking into the nematicide space. We first launched the first seed applied nematicide in Seed Care back in 2006 with Evicta and Epimectin and Cotton in US. And then since then, that portfolio have revolutionized throughout the, the world. Um, we today um, are working on the Timerium technology um, that will really be a step change in how farmers look at nematode uh, management. One of the challenges, Andrea, and you probably know this, is that nematode is not one solution that will fix it all. When you first have nematodes, you have them forever. You can't really get rid of them. So it's a holistic approach. Um, you pretty much take what we say sometimes, throw the kitchen sink at it, so crop rotation. Uh, you need to use genetic varieties that have tolerance or resistance to these nematodes. And then, of course, seed treatment is a key component. And with the Tagnerum technology, we will be able to move that bar up to a level that we have not seen before in the industry, and, and we're really excited to be able to do that. It is sounding exciting. So there's one thing I'm taking from here, which is the fact that Timerium is able to control all plant parasit parasitic nematodes. Yeah, this is what was unique about it and what our chemists and our scientists did an excellent job when they were looking at this product is uh, to be able to find a molecule that have, um, have um, control 
uh, our activity on, on all plant parasitic nematode in the field on our major row crops here. So let's talk a bit about um, uh, the quadrant behind you. So we see uh, four pieces in here, which is uh, below, above, uh, easy, and sustainability. These are the benefits that Timerium brings. Uh, what, do, what does Timerium do below the soil? That's right, uh, that's right, Andreas. So if we talk about the below ground, of course it is the broad spectrum activity on plant parasitic nematode. But an additional benefit uh, we have with Timerium is also it has some uh, disease activity on specific soil borne diseases which is really unique. So many, many of these complexes that happen below ground, that are interactions. So you have nematode creating wounds on the roots for these pathogens that can get into the roots or vice versa. So here we have an active ingredient that can give you activity against both those components. And so that's a really unique thing. And then on the quartus you see that's the above ground, what we have identified is there's also some foliar diseases that, have, that are occurring during the early seedling stage, mm -hmm. stage that uh, it has activity on as well. So it gives you, I would say, peace of mind if you're a grower that you get you know, the protection from the below ground from nematode, soil borne diseases, and then of course some of these earlier foliar pathogens mm -hmm. that can occur in the field. So, so this is really, really great. So provides protection below the ground, above the ground as well, yeah. and it's also simple to use. How is well, that? Well, that, that was really, when this project was started back, you know, a uh, long, long time ago, of course, nematode was the key target. But another thing that was some challenges were some of the nematicides we see in the market today, the formulations are not the mm -hmm. best, they're difficult to handle. So this was a key target. And our chemist and our formulation chemists have done an outstanding job coming up with a final product that uh, is easy to apply, uh, low use rate, safe to the seed. Uh, we've done many, many years of seed safety uh, studies. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, it gives these characteristics so we can use it both on farm but also the last seed company's uh, seed plant. So, so this whole holistic uh, formulation really move the use of a nematicide seed treatment uh, a step up. And the last piece is around sustainability. Timerium is still a chemical product, so how come it can be, uh, can have a sustainable profile at the same time? That's right. Um, so sustainability is a key focus for us in Syngenta, and, and you hear about it and, and you read about it. You know, we're very focused on, on, um, on improving the sustainability platform around food production. And, and uh, Timerium, because of its very low use rate, um, that's one benefit. But we really, what we have identified is some of these pathogens and nematodes uh, where we have had problems before, we can now promote conservation tillage practices and no tillage practices that previously have not been able to be done uh, to be achieved because uh, you have too many of these uh, stresses doing at the establishment. So a great example you will hear from Crystal later. Uh, Crystal is from Australia, and in Australia, uh, moisture is always a challenge, uh, so we have to conserve it. And no-tillage practices is something that is, has been promoted for many, many decades there. And, um, but a lot of times when you have these kind of practices, you may have problems that are occurring. Mm -hmm. A good example is crown rot, Fusarium crown rot, that is a big challenge there. And now with Timerium technology, uh, we will be able to go in and tell farmers that you can still be able to have a crop, you can still make a profit, you can still use conservation tillage practices to conserve the soil moisture because all this uniqueness that this technology will bring. So this is, uh, this is a great story. Well, it does sound very exciting. And I have to ask you the question, which is probably on everybody's lips. When can we get our, our hands on the product? Well, we are we're still on the timeline, so what we have promised earlier to, to get in the market, and it will come up very soon. OK, good. Well, we are all looking forward for that. Thank you so much. So since we're on the topic of sustainability, um, I have quite a lot of my customers, at least, that are asking me, when is seed care going to bring a uh, biological offer to the market? What, what can we say to them? Well, Andrea, we've been in the market for a long time, and, and um, um, our first biological, so let me roll back here. So biologicals, we're talking about biocontrol and biostimulants. And uh, we launched the first biocontrol product in 2013 in US. It was called Clariva PN. It's a biological nematicide, and uh, then since then we have gone into what we call the biostimulant space, and we've been in that area for five years. Um, this is an area that is very close to our, our, our heart. Um, we have currently have three products in the market today, um, Epivio Energy, Epivio Vigor, and Epivio Sky, 
and um, they are all in this, I will call them category of biostimulants, so either they're stimulating the plant metabolism and early growth of these seedlings and, and, and plants, or they activate some of these uh, nutrients in the soil and make them available to the seedling uh, during that establishment phase. So they have multiple, multiple factors. And can seed companies um, or other users all over the world be able to use them? Absolutely. Uh, my best recommendation to you is to go to your local Syngenta rep and get uh, information about registrations. It's a little bit more complicated with the biologicals versus the chemicals. Uh, a lot of times the biological, they will interact with a soil type, temperature, nutrient, moisture. And uh, so it's not like a chemistry could be more black and white, so you can easily register it throughout uh, many soil types and environmental conditions. Uh, these uh, biologicals and particularly the, the biostimulants are more related around a, a more, uh, um, they're more depending on conditions. So you, you will not see them across the world, but they will be more targeted. For example, PV Sky, PV Vigor, we sell in Brazil that fit very well into the Brazil climate and the Brazil soil types. Uh, PV Energy, now registered throughout most of Europe, uh, fit very well to the environmental conditions here. Uh, so, so it all depends, but my best recommendation is go to your local Syngenta rep and get your information on what is registered and, uh, and what's the plans. Yes. Thank you, Pala. And maybe one last question on this. What's next in, this, in the space of biologicals? Um, uh, Syngenta has uh, recently acquired Valagro, which is a, um, a famous company in the area of biostimulants. Well, we, we, we are investing in biologicals like many of the ag companies today are investing in this area. The acquisition of Alacro was a, a huge win for Syngenta. Uh, we see a lot of opportunities with Alacro. Uh, Alacro was mostly, of course, um, uh, working in the crop protection foliar business, um, but they have a lot of the building blocks that uh, we now look into from a CCAP perspective, and there will be uh, some opportunities there hopefully down the road. Great. So we had some great news about products. Our strategy, John T mentioned at the beginning, is about uh, products, application, and services. This is our value proposition. The next piece, we are going to talk to about Crystal, who is going to show us how the Seed Care Institute is supporting our customers uh, in their journey. Sure. Thanks, Andrea. And the most important part, as we heard from the beginning, is really that we have innovative products, but we combine those with the application uh, advice and end-to-end and -end service as well. And the Seeker Institute network plays a um, central role in bringing this expertise uh, to our customers and really on the ground as well with our Seeker Institute network. Here you can see actually the CCAT Institute network and a range of, um, of sites, uh, 15 in total. So we started the CCAT Institute network actually in Stein in Switzerland. And uh, you can see that the um, CCAT Institute network has some newcomers. Uh, you might not be aware of Mexico, which is now on the map, servicing our Latin America. American North region, and also Japan as well, which is for direct seeded rice in our new Riser Care offer. Um, as well, the Russian site in Ramon is uh, being expanded right now, uh, so you can look forward to that in, in Q4. Uh, and in addition, the, um, the uh, Institute in Singapore uh, has been relaunched this month, actually, uh, to service the uh, emerging markets in Asia Pacific. Right. But I used to work in Turkey before, and our customers there, especially the seed care customers, they would they love to come and visit the Stein Institute. It was state of the art always. Mm -hmm. How how are we still managing to connect to our customers during these uh, difficult times during COVID? It's a really uh, difficult situation globally with COVID, but actually we managed to connect with customers often in a virtual sense. Our institutes have been closed for the majority of the last year. Um, and we are actually reopening our doors in Stanton this month uh, in the US, uh, where the vaccines have been rolled out quite successfully and we will maintain <coughs> COVID principles uh, and good he health and safety provisions. Uh, and the other institutes we hope to open also um, later in this year. 
Um, of course, we can connect uh, digitally in this time. Uh, actually, we've done on-site uh, remote support with uh, engineering solutions. Uh, we also brought CK Campus, our uh, training offer, um, so that we can make sure that we still train and steward our products appropriately in these times, um, and that we are able to also virtually demonstrate the benefits of our products with marketing support materials like augmented reality and videos when we can't actually take growers to the field or to the institute as well and and how do you see the future when the situation does return to normal will we come back to to face to face full meetings again well it's a good question I think everyone's knocking on the door to come to our Institute so we can't wait to welcome everyone but in addition I think there will be a new normal and it also um, opens our mind to bring new technology so to bring digital offers, maybe more immediate offers uh, to customers' requests. But of course, we still have this network for a reason. We need to maintain our local, uh, our local presence, uh, our local staff and uh, experience as well. And so we will still welcome everybody to our institutes and expand our network, but we will also extend our reach uh, by digital and try to bring the farm as well inside the institute. Wouldn't that be great? So there's lots of things happening in the digital world. We get lots of creativity uh, during these COVID times. That's great. So we talked about network mm -hmm. and it looks like we are present in the key locations of the world to support our customers. How about how? How are we supporting our customers? Sure. So um, actually in the CCAT Institute network, we have six global service categories. And uh, in these six service categories, we're able to touch the big R&D engine of Syngenta uh, in bringing together uh, innovative products, uh, innovative recipes as well, and we're able to support the quality needs to make sure there's always quality standards in place and that the seeds that we're applying them to are, are safe with this formulation. In addition, the, um, the application and stewardship area is more customer facing, so we're able to go out to have a, a physical presence with customers, uh, make sure that the products are used appropriately, and that there are also um, any upgrades or uh, necessary actions for a new product introduction, for example, are maintained. And finally, we always make sure that we're training our people. I mentioned now also online with our CCAG campus, internally and externally, um, as well as marketing support to demonstrate the products, create the demand for the new technologies, and what benefits does it really bring? Well, we've seen that the market is always changing. The trends are changing. How do we manage to keep our services uh, local and on trend? Sure. Well, the number one thing is we have to speak with our customers, and staying connected is the most important way. Um, the localization is also really important because uh, different trends are happening, but generally across the market we can see trends on biologicals uh, that we just talked about with Palais. Um, and also we have um, additional trends uh, on digitizing our services, I mentioned as well. Um, as well as new things like sustainability, regenerative agriculture, um, we need to move ourselves to this direction. And we have many customers, we have big seed companies, and we also have a downstream market which we need to serve, service through our partners. And they require sometimes different services because we can't be out there with thousands of smallholders, for example. So we need to find different services uh, that fit their needs as well. How can we know uh, what our customers need? We need to talk to them. <laughs> yes, for sure, we can't, uh, we can't uh, dream in an ivory tower what services customers need. And the localized uh, aspect of the network and sharing the best practice across the network with all these sites. Um, we have new crops coming to some regions. We can gain experience from other markets. Uh, we have new ideas coming up all the time, uh, just like for our products, for our services. So the main source of all inspiration is our customers. Great. Well, thank you very much, Kristen. I'm really looking forward <laughs> to visiting a seed care institute whenever we're, we are allowed. We're very, we're very happy to welcome people again. Yes. So we spoke about products, about two new exciting products. But we still have uh, quite a few products that are doing a lot of heavy work to support you and your <coughs> crops. So we have a lot of unsung heroes still in the portfolio. Pale, can you talk to, uh, to us about any of them? Well, there are many heroes, you're absolutely right. But this year we have specific one hero that we celebrating and that's Vibrance. Uh, this year is 10 years ago that uh, Vibrance received its first registration. And what's really unique about this one, it was a project that was started to focus solely for seed tripping users only. Um, it was uh, developed to really go after the Raxotonia root rot and, um, and uh, the protection for that. It was particularly a big issue in, 
in soybean, in cereals, in canola and oilseed rape. And, and then after it was launched, we recognized that there was some very unique characteristics to Vibrant. So Vibrant also have it's what we call the rooting power story around it. And it was really that in addition to get really unique disease protections and healthy roots, uh, rice octone is one of these root nipplers that never will kill the plant. It will just feed on these fine roots. It also gave the plant larger root, root system. And that helped the farmers on yield stability and more consistent yield across, across the environment. So this has been a great story. Um, you know, Syngenta won the Acro Award in 2011 for the story around this. And um, really the, the story around protecting the plant uh, promoting uh, root growth and then preserving soil was, was a big component and fit very well into our sustainability message around a um, uh, particular good growth plan on how to preserve uh, our soils and, 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 and minimizing the impact, uh, promoting conservation tills, price and no-till, just like I talked about the Tachmeum technology before. So it has been a great story. Um, you know, last 10 years have been great and the next 10 years is probably going to be even better or greater. So yeah, great, great success story. It's great. I, uh, my first memory of vibrance is seeing a rhizotron with the section of the root. I think uh, everybody remembers. It, it's quite striking. That's right. It was really, you know, this, and that was the CK Institute that really was um, a forefront on how to promote uh, and show the story around what's happening below ground. Because, you know, many farmers, um, I'm an agronomist, you know, you like to you don't like to go out and get really dirty and dig up the soil. So if you can't see it from the highway when you're driving down, you never see, really see the small details. But that's a, the, the whole landscape be, below the ground, the complexity uh, is, is an untapped error. And, uh, and this is particularly where we will go with the Timerium uh, technology, you know, that the, the, the importance of roots and protecting the soil and improving the soil health cannot be said enough. This is really critical for the sustainability of agriculture in the future. Well, clearly this is a subject that is really exciting us for us uh, and we're passionate about. Yeah. But we would need to pause the discussion here and we have a few more minutes uh, for a Q&A. So if you just give me two seconds and see what questions we have that came up. Okay, um, oh, this, is, this is one for you, Jonti. Um, what are we doing in the area of regenerative ag? So look, um, uh, we, we're doing a huge amount of investment, uh, as you're aware, and Pali alluded to it a second ago, we had the Good Growth Plan. We committed to invest in sustainable innovation and committed to $2 billion over a 10-year frame. Um, that's the global level. We're obviously also moving into biologicals, as Pali said, but we're doing things around Seed Care Institute as well. Maybe Pali, you want to refer a little bit more about the portfolio and how we're developing the portfolio in, in the biological space and the Regen Ag space. Yeah, so that's great, John. So particularly the biologicals um, is an area where you know we are working in and playing in this area right now and are identifying opportunities and have, and have launched you know the PVO family that I talked about earlier. Uh, but also on our research targets, you know, we, we're thinking about this when we develop a new product offers that um, we want to be sure that they, they fit into our recommendation and what does it take in regenerative ag. So that means um, we want to be sure we have products that uh, uh, staying on the seeds, low use rate, um, we can really help to minimize the tillage practices out there. We believe fr from a company standpoint that's very critical. Um, so there are many of these variables we take into consideration. Um, but I think what you mentioned before, the biologicals is a great example on areas where we are, we are we're working now. Okay. So uh, there is another question maybe for you, Jonti. Uh, it's more of a regulatory na nature. Are there any updates related to metalaxyl M for sunflower seed treatment in EU27? So look, I think all of you are aware of the situation around the registration and the re-registration of uh, metalaxyl and methanoxam. We're in the process, we're hitting the timelines we believe, um, but the reality is, and you guys know it because you're asking for derogations uh, around the EU uh, and hopefully we'll get those derogations in place so we can support you, but that's because you're doing all the work and you're doing the running around making sure the European Union are aware of the critical importance and the critical nature of methanoxin. So we're working hard and let's hope that your support, your work with the authorities to make sure they understand the, the need of this product pays dividends. The re-registration specifically, we believe should come back to us for the planting season 2023. 
Um, another question, um, if Tyram is banned, maybe for you, Pale, mm -hmm. uh, what may be other options for seed treatment? So Thyram has been in the market for many, many years, and I think every seed company knows Thyram out there. Um, one of the things, and I will use vegetable seeds as a great example, um, when Thyram got, got banned in, in the European Union, um, with our far more platform within Syngenta Seed Care, we will be able to close that gap. So flutioxanil is an, a great example on a on an act, on a, on a active ingredient that's formulated uh, with registration throughout the world so we can feel the need from, for a vegetable seed company. As many of you know, a lot of the seed is produced um, in Europe, and, but there's a massive amount of seed movement, particularly on vegetable seeds, to North America, to South America, to Asia, India. So it's very important that we have these registration and platforms in place. And with the far more platform and with our portfolio in Syngenta, we've been able to meet that need for, for, for the customer. So, so this is one of the benefits that we have in Syngenta. We've been in the business, you heard John to say it before, for more than 40 years. And we have this registration support and, and uh, to our customers so they can continue their business if things like, uh, uh, if an AI like Thyram will disappear in the market. So. Thank you, Pale, and thank you everybody for the questions. We have a couple of minutes left, and I would like to hand it over back to Jonti uh, for closing remarks. So look, Andrea, thanks very much, and thanks to the team. Um, most importantly, thanks to you guys. Um, you're our customers over more than 40 years. We continue to devote our time and energy, as you heard from Crystal, we want to understand your needs, meet your needs better, so you can then deliver the right quality seed to your customers around the world. We'll continue to do so. Uh, we'll bring new technologies, innovations in Timerium, biologicals, and, and other products. But you know what? Thanks once again for being our partners. We continue to look forward to seeing you physically, face-to-face, -face, but most importantly, physically face-to-face -face and safe. So please take care, be safe, and uh, see you soon, hopefully. Thanks very much. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon for the ones that are in Europe. I am uh, Francesco, uh, CEO and uh, founder of uh, Quaisens. And today I'd like to uh, introduce you to the uh, QSorter uh, technology. So um, maybe for those that uh, don't know us, so we are specialists in uh, uh, high-speed single kernel technology. So we have develop in the course of the last years a bunch of uh, solutions for the seed industry that are able to detect uh, quality in different dimensions, uh, most important in the field of purity on every single seed and uh, to sort uh, uh, accordingly. So this is what uh, we, we stand for. And I would like maybe to give you a little bit of uh, uh, you know, insights into the business. So next uh, slide, please. So the company was actually founded in uh, 2010 uh, by myself and another colleague. So we uh, both uh, experienced in uh, sensing technologies and uh, um, in particular, we were working on uh, satellite missions to uh, detect natural parameters uh, in uh, uh, agriculture, crop, canopy, water, and different types of uh, um, targets. And uh, we came up with the idea of applying similar technologies uh, uh, to the ground and not to the space uh, to really try bringing like a sensitive innovation into the business uh, of agriculture and food. And uh, as of today, so we have uh, uh, about 40 people. We mostly work between uh, Western Europe and the United States. 
and uh, uh, we have uh, developed a couple of platforms that I will introduce you in a second. Maybe next slide, please. Uh, so as of today, I am uh, very happy to, to say that uh, we are cooperating and collaborating with uh, many leaders of the seed industry and food industry to really advance uh, uh, quality uh, in uh, seed the breeding and uh, uh, production by tackling some of the critical uh, hurdle of the industry. Um, and uh, next slide, please. So maybe when uh, we look at uh, the seed uh, value chain, we uh, all know uh, about how much value are we talking about. Probably for all of you that are sitting in this call, it goes without saying that uh, uh, the value of uh, uh, one seed is much higher than the value of one grain of the same, the same you know, crop uh, uh, environment. And uh, you know, just to give an example to set uh, a sort of a benchmark. So if we look at uh, corn, we possibly talking about $300 per metric ton whenever we buy grains for maybe ethanol or for food production, while we talk maybe about 30 to 50 times more value per metric unit when we uh, look at the seeds. So therefore, it uh, is of uh, customer importance to uh, define um, what quality are we dealing with and uh, spots where the problem are, problems are. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so when uh, we, uh, you know, examine a little bit uh, uh, through the uh, magnifying lens, uh, the seed uh, production chain, uh, we can definitely um, realize that there are a number of problems that are happening along the, uh, the process. So starting from the breeding, we go into multiplication and then into production itself. So all in all, uh, we estimated, and these are numbers that actually are provided by our customers, that about maybe up to 10% of the seeds are lost because of purity issues. And when we look at purity, we probably talk about three dimensions. So one of them is the uh, uh, genetic purity. One of them is the germination rate. Uh, and uh, last uh, but not least, uh, uh, there are the physical purity issues uh, related to either field contaminations or maybe uh, cross contaminations during storage, during processing and so on. Now, most importantly is, uh, yeah, uh, of course, there is a lot of, uh, you know, economical value in there. But it's also true that uh, uh, at the same time, we are wasting arable land and producing a lot of CO2 for nothing. I always like to bring up uh, the example of uh, the corn again. And uh, so whenever you, you waste one metric ton of uh, uh, corn, you actually wasting one entire soccer field of land that could have been dedicated to maybe food production, for example, and you are emitting a lot of CO2 equivalent to possibly the one produced by three cars uh, making the round of the world for about an entire year. Now, the good news is that uh, in a way, in this uh, discarded fractions, which we said they amount to up to 10%, uh, a very uh, good alphabet is actually good seeds. And then the question is like, how can you recover these seeds? And this is where we definitely are focusing. So we are offering our customers the possibility of, first of all, understanding the entity of the problem uh, when it comes to the purity. And on the second side, thanks to our production scale platform, we can in fact sort entire lots and recover whatever of good is left into the uh, uh, into the basket. Uh, there are obviously so many details about the logistics and when are you able to recover, if it's uh, before coating or after coating, maybe after packaging. But these are all aspects we could go maybe uh, later through maybe the Q&A. Can you jump a couple of slides forward, please? Slide number seven. Yeah, one more. Yeah. So um, maybe a, a little bit of info about the technology. So in these slides, you see a couple of uh, platforms. Actually, the one that is a bit uh, shaded on the right, it's a laboratory platform, which we call QSorted Explorer. And this is really aiming at helping people understanding 
what quality is in the purity dimensions. So you, you throw in a lot, every seed is analyzed and a certain bunch, a certain amount of parameters is then defined afterwards. While the one on the left is our new baby and uh, we just installed the first unit uh, a couple of months ago in the United States and it's a production scale unit. And uh, so if you have a, a lot of several metric tons, you could actually dump it into this device and the device can sort it uh, according to your quality and purity parameters. Next slide, please. So why is the Q sorter quality sense uh, uh, unique? Well, as of today, we still can claim that this is the only technology able uh, that combines in just one spot, first of all, uh, different type of uh, uh, sensing equipment. In particular, we can uh, uh, measure with a high resolution spectrometer inside every kernel. Uh, and detecting therefore some uh, light uh, uh, back that would then uh, be proportional to some of the nutritional or compositional elements of the grain of the kernel. And on the other side, we can even detect from the outside with camera technology, shape, size, any morphological aspect. Uh, so this is one specific element that we bring that is pretty unique. On the other side, uh, it's also true that uh, we do assess, as I said later, uh, the earlier, every individual grain. So thanks to vacuum technology, we can in fact block or lock every kernel in one position and bring it in front of the measurement area. This is very, very important because uh, other measuring technologies out there, they rely maybe on shoot systems or belt systems. And uh, the fact that this, the grain or the kernel is not uh, constrained to a transport mean uh, doesn't allow really a precise measurements of certain parameters, especially the compositional one, which are the, the key parameters you really want to uh, 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 understand. So now, once you have these uh, two data sets of data, so the spectrum, and the 3D image, you can then apply a certain set of algorithms in the field of uh, neural network, machine learning, deep learning, regression, and extracts, uh, extract a bunch of quality parameters. So it's like you have a, a Facebook profile for every kernel in your sample or in your lot. Now, what is the output of that? Well, on one side is a digital output, so you have a huge collection of data points, which could turn out to be very useful in a number of applications. But on the other side, you can actually sort physically into A, B, C. And in fact, we also innovate a little bit there because uh, uh, we can offer more than two sorts. So with our small device, we go up to three sorts. With the big one, we could go up to five sorts in just one pass. So you could combine, I know if you are looking at a corn kernel, you could say, I would like to have the kernels that have this type of germination, and maybe this type of size in the same basket and combine then, you know, for more classes, other type of criteria and, and, and parameters. Uh, in the next slide, we observe a screenshot of the transport mean, which uh, differs a little bit. So in the laboratory unit, the QSorter Explorer, we do have a belt. Uh, under the belt, there is uh, low pressure applied, and there are little perforations on this belt where every seat is actually locked in and uh, transported into, through, throughout the whole process, so sensing, data extraction, sorting while in the big device that can sort up to 3,000 kernels per second, we have uh, the same concept but uh, applied to a drum, which inside has, again, uh, low pressure to constrain the grain on its uh, uh, outer surface. I would like to show you now a very short uh, video. So if you guys could actually send that video live. Let's see if we start. Yeah. Unit 
So these are brains going uh, also very fast and analyzed. Yeah, these are the screenshots with the multiple swords. And this is the first installation in the US into a uh, sweet corn uh, production facility where we have uh, helped the customer uh, making sure that uh, the lots were GMO free. So in particular, they were not uh, bearing contamination from uh, field corn. But other than that, we did also look at uh, uh, re-germinated kernels and broken kernels and sorted accordingly. So in this uh, little video, you have seen a little bit uh, the two platforms, so the small ones and the big one. Uh, the small one has a laboratory side, so you can place it over a table. And as I said, it's very easy to use and to uh, uh, you know integrate into your quality flow or into your breeding flow. And uh, the big one is uh, definitely bigger than that. So we're talking about two meters tall for a, a 1.5 meters, uh, you know, uh, width and uh, um, a length uh, uh, a footprint. And uh, yeah, I think in the last part of the video, you have seen uh, uh, our first installation into the States where we have helped a sweet corn customer to uh, remove uh, field corn contamination, so GMO contamination but we also help them increase in germination by removing all the pre-germinated kernels and uh, the broken kernels. Um, I also like to mention about these applications that most of the job was done with the uh, near infrared spectrometer. And uh, it's not that obvious that with uh, camera technology, you could actually, um, uh, you know, uh, detect all these uh, details at a very high uh, precision. Um, in this slide, you have a little bit of a flavor of what the Q-Sorter technology can do. So if we start from the top left, uh, you can obviously, obviously go into uh, um, the uh, physical parameters. And there, you know, uh, it's also interesting to see which accuracy we can bring compared to uh, maybe scanners or other things in there that uh, today help you in this direction. Uh, we go into the effects. Uh, of different types, as I mentioned earlier, uh, broken, but could be also some discolorations and so on. That could be very useful, for instance, if you want to clean uh, uh, production cults and recover the seeds that you have in there. But the most interesting parts are coming on the right. So first of all, it's on the compositional side, and I'm just listing here some of the usual properties you could go for um, and uh, uh, oil moisture but it's also true that we have did develop projects with uh, predictions of more complex things such as maybe fatty acids and some type of protein but last uh, but not least when you go for production scale i think people are probably shocked or, or scared of too much data. So the goal is always to really transform all the information that you detect on a per kernel level into maybe one meaningful parameter that uh, the, the plant can, can handle. And uh, in that specific cases, we definitely look into purity and uh, germination. And we have several projects in this uh, direction that uh, uh, demonstrate how the Q-Sorter can in fact help uh, seed companies uh, optimize in here. Um, Maybe just to go next slide, please, uh, a second. Uh, so just for understanding, I think uh, one of the key underlying assumptions that enables all this type of innovation is really the single kernel distribution. So as of today, uh, probably 99% of the technologies out there are 
helping you define like an average content, right? But uh, uh, the EQ sorter can can in fact tell you also what happens around that uh, uh, average content. Now, I, I bring up a very simple example with uh, Moisture, but uh, um, we look at some customers sometimes that they had uh, maybe identical average uh, of Moisture in two different lots, but then distributions were completely different. And then the question is like, okay, how do I handle these two? Do I store them differently? Do I dry them differently? Now with mo moisture, the example is quite straightforward, but uh, the same could be applied to any other parameter um, out there. Um, maybe I like to switch to slide number 15, if possible. Uh, still uh, another couple. Yeah, this one, please. Yeah. So maybe uh, we come now to the final, like how people are using our technology. So obviously, when it comes to uh, breeding, uh, you have the possibility of screening up to 30 seeds per second uh, with respect to multiple parameters uh, in uh, just one go. And uh, this is obviously one of the reasons why people buy and, and use our technology. Uh, so in a non-destructive and non-invasive way, you can in fact select the seeds that you really need to, to bring forward into your program and uh, optimize a number of aspects. So first of all, uh, your statistical confidence increases enormously because uh, thanks to this speed, you have a lot of data to base your judgment on and your conclusions on when uh, choosing on what to do with a specific family variety or trait uh, and uh, propagate it into the next generation. You can uh, definitely optimize your uh, field trials by having more dedicated plots to maybe more complex type of, uh, 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 you know, uh, selections. And uh, uh, last but not least, uh, as I said earlier, a lot of data is produced and uh, this allows you to also build um, I would say historicals that you can query over time and observe how populations are changing on a year to year basis so uh, in, uh, as of today we have uh, customers for this specific applications in the field of soy corn wheat uh, barley, rice, uh, peanuts, and I would be glad, I mean, uh, to, to tell you about it uh, maybe later through the Q&A. Um, then on the other side, if we move to the next slide, we talk more about production. And here, as I said earlier, uh, the big technology or the big platform is really the game changer because, yeah, it's nice to have the data, but then what do you do with this data? And the answer is uh, coming through the your rights. And so whenever there are some uh, challenges with uh, purity, you can then you know dump the entire pro box or bag into the horizon and the horizon will be sorting that for you. So what are the uh, maybe areas in which we are working uh, today? So we have uh, very exciting projects in the field of uh, genetic purity. Now, maybe before you guys ask, so definitely we are not not able to detect the DNA of the seed, but uh, if uh, uh, the DNA, let's say, engineering has an impact on the phenotyping, on the compositional aspects of the kernel, we can definitely detect that. And so far, we have seen many cases where this is uh, actually true, and therefore uh, our sensor can pick these differences and sorting accordingly. We are working with a number of tollers as well in optimizing uh, cults or discards uh, that are produced during production by gravity tables, by color sorters, by any other type of uh, technology. And this is also very, I would say, very interesting uh, uh, project because it offers uh, customers the possibility of gaining already today by starting, you know, sorting in a dedicated fashion certain uh, lots that uh, suffer uh, from this problem. And last but not least, we also look in at uh, germination and uh, we have also there projects in the field of uh, corn, some vegetable seeds that we are collecting data for and uh, we are observing also uh, good results uh, uh, coming up. So as I said earlier, purity is the key word. Uh, while with the small technology, we help understanding about purity. With the big technology, we help uh, recovering seeds that suffer from purity issues. 
I come to my last slide, the next one, please. So this is just uh, an overview of our portfolio as of today of uh, crops and applications. And uh, um, th there is definitely a lot to be done, but uh, at the moment, I think we have quite some focus on the oil crops to start with, in particular, I would say corn and soybeans. Uh, we also are looking at uh, sunflower and the canola. These are next on our pipelines. In addition to this, we also, uh, you know, work with a bunch of other commodities that have uh, probably a strong impact, uh, uh, maybe in the food industry more than on the uh, seed industry. So, other than that, I think I will be then uh, happy to uh, take uh, some questions. So please feel free to write them in the in the live chat. Um, in the meanwhile, I could uh, maybe answer some of the questions that we received uh, before the seminar. In particular, somebody asked about the purity of the accepted fraction. Well, um, the answer there is that uh, it depends on uh, um, the applications that we are uh, uh, looking after. And uh, uh, when uh, we talk about purity, there is uh, somehow a trend number that uh, goes around 95%. Uh, and uh, uh, that is at least the minimum that you should try to achieve when sorting uh, with the purpose of increasing uh, purity. So 95%, um, I think it's generally true for uh, uh, maybe germination. If it's about purity in terms of genetics, there is obviously a difference whether you target the parent seeds or the production seeds. So the production of the parent seeds has definitely higher requirements in terms of purity than the offsprings. And uh, if you talk about purity, then physical purity, we probably uh, also traveling in the range of 95% uh, there. I think a follow-up question was about uh, the reject. So how much good product you should throw along with the bad product in order to ensure that uh, uh, the good fraction meets your uh, uh, purity requirements. And there, uh, it depends a bit on projects, but uh, we generally travel between the 1% to the 3% amount of reject. And I have to say that this is a very good uh, uh, performance if you compare to any other uh, sorting uh, uh, technology out there. Again, please feel free to write down questions. I'm going through the list of uh, existing questions as I speak. Um, somebody is asking about germination uh, results, if you're able to predict it or, or not. Um, so, so far, we've been working on uh, um, two different, uh, I think, pipelines for germination. So one of them, as I mentioned earlier, is about maybe looking at uh, a lot and removing whatever is not uniform. And that comes in different uh, shapes. So there were maybe broken seeds, there were very small seeds, there were seeds that had a, a pre-germ, not always detectable with the naked eye because it's just about to you know, emerge under the outer surface of the grain. And there we have observed um, uh, like a range of uh, impure, uh, uh, range of uh, germination increase from five percent to twenty percent. So that result was uh, really amazing because some lots for the customers were really unusable and therefore with zero value in terms of uh, uh, dollars. And after that sorting. The, the recovery rate and the value recovery rate was super high. So this is one approach. So you try to, to, to really get rid of whatever is non-uniform and, and uh, see what happens with the last lot. On the other side, we, had, uh, uh, we have projects where we are looking at uh, the capability of detecting whether something germinates or not. And so far, we've been working on uh, corn. We did some tests on uh, fennel seeds, on artichoke seeds, so a couple of vegetable seeds. And uh, uh, we can definitely say that the, the, the technology is able to say with uh, 85 to 90 percent accuracy uh, what is the uh, like the possibility of 
having a plant afterwards. The next level for us is more understanding about the quality of this plant. So more in terms of bigger, uh, what we can uh, um, predict uh, beforehand. But obviously this could be really like a, a great uh, uh, game changer for the, for the industry. Oh, in the meanwhile, uh, one question arrives. Somebody is asking about the pricing of the lab sites unit. So uh, projects are very custom in a way because we have to deal with certain germplasm that are not uh, definitely unique. So there is a certain level of you know personalization that we should go for. And uh, uh, but to give you a ballpark figure, we're probably traveling around the one hundred and fifty thousand dollars for one unit. Uh, and uh, at the moment, we also, you know, uh, activating a sort of a subscription model where maybe we lower the initial uh, payment amount so for people to, you know, get more uh, familiar with the technology and then maybe agree on a five years subscription that gives you access to a certain amount of uh, uh, services and licenses to algorithms. So that's a little bit the, the price range of the small unit. Uh, generally, in the projects that we see, I think uh, one of the critical uh, parameters is the, always the amount of samples. Obviously, the larger the amount of samples you deal with, the faster is the return on investment. But uh, generally, we see uh, like ROI in the range of, I would say, between two and three years. That's what we observe in the, in the seed industry. Um, there was another question uh, about algorithms. I think I quickly touched base before by saying that uh, we use a large spectrum of algorithms. Um, and uh, there, we never try to make things complex if it's not necessary. So we usually uh, look at every problem in an independent way and try to uh, you know, solve it in the in the easiest way, but sometimes key things can get very complex. And uh, when we go to uh, maybe deep learning, machine learning, uh, that's obviously uh, yeah, maybe that that is bringing more sophistication. Uh, but on the other side, that kind of approaches also offer uh, certain advantages because the device can actually learn over time and improve the robustness of the algorithm. So this, I think, it's uh, something to really, uh, yeah, exploit maybe over a certain amount of seasons uh, and data that you have collected into the database. Uh, Somebody is asking whether we have a presence in uh, United States, and uh, well, uh, honestly, we do possibly about eighty percent of our business in the states. So yes, we are present. And uh, we are currently, uh, you know, ramping up offices in uh, Iowa and the Midwest to, to be uh, more closer to our customers. We also partnering with a company that has uh, quite a few uh, technicians available in the field. So especially in the case of the uh, production scale unit, that's, I think, uh, very, very important. And maybe one aspect that we are also uh, like uh, pushing a little bit more forward is the sorting services. So uh, in some cases, probably the cost of the technology, especially the large scale unit is a bit uh, prohibitive if you don't have certain volumes to, to sort. So what we are starting to offer are services. So if you have anywhere some trouble with purity and you would like us to maybe look at that problem and and sort your lots we can definitely arrange that and we have at this point two locations that we could uh, uh, go for so one is in uh, illinois that's for us and one is in switzerland for europe so please feel free to contact us and uh, you know we could uh, uh, talk about that uh, more in detail Um, any questions?
All right, so I think uh, we are done with the session. So I thank uh, all the people that have uh, joined us uh, today for this uh, uh, webinar. Um, uh, maybe I just like to mention that you can, uh, you know, contact us through LinkedIn or simply writing an email to uh, info at uh, qualisense.com and, uh, you know, uh, address any questions you would like to us to answer. Um, I also like to, 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 to tell you that we can organize uh, live demos uh, for you. So we have a specific setup with cameras and we can guide you through the maybe the various platforms. And uh, last but not least, uh, we also uh, could arrange some uh, try and buy so you could uh, use the technology and test the platforms for maybe a month or a few weeks. And then if certain requirements are met, we can, you know, transform that uh, trial into a, a purchase. Uh, so, uh, again, think about all the inputs that I've been sharing with you guys. I understand that maybe not all of you know us, so please uh, take the time to, to get in touch. And uh, uh, once more, I thank you for this opportunity. I would like to thank you, the uh, ISF, for such a chance and uh, looking forward to, to meet and to talk with uh, many of you in the next uh, days or months. Thank you, everybody. I wish you a very great day.